This is Somewhere in the Skies with Ryan Sprague. Today on the show, we are joined by television writer, comedian, Bigfoot hunter, and podcast host, Andrew Sanford. Hot on the heels of the exciting news of signatures of alien life possibly being detected on Venus, we are taking a look at two movies that ask the questions, are we alone? And if not, how can we make contact? Although these movies couldn't be any more diametrically opposed with how they decide to answer these questions. First up, we look at 1996's The Arrival. Best line of the movie, Zane says, actually, I look like a can of smashed assholes. <laughs> and then we jump ahead 20 years to 2016's Arrival. The movie is sad because it's so hopeful. When the movie came out, it felt more within grasp. Um, but I, I like uh, since then, I've just gone further away from, from that kind of hopefulness to what humanity is capable of. And like, don't get me wrong, it was humanity under extreme circumstances, but you know, we're in pretty fucking extreme circumstances right now, and we're not doing great. It is a roller coaster of emotions as we navigate our way through both films in all their amazing and ridiculous glory. You have arrived to the arrivals. Welcome, everyone, to a very special episode of Summer in the Skies. Today, we are joined by one of my best friends, colleagues, and just all-around awesome dude, Andrew Sanford, is joining us for an epic movie showdown between 1996's The Arrival and 2016's Arrival. Andrew, how you doing, buddy? Ryan! Hello, hello, I'm... Happy to be here for the, oh God, how many, I'm trying to think of the amount of movies we've talked about, like, because we've got, let's, we talked about It on here. Yep. We, we talked did. about um, Fire in the Sky. We talked about Communion. The other Sky, Communion. Fuck, I forgot about Communion. Yeah. <laughs> how could you forget that one? Like, I don't yeah. know. Well, what was the other um, one we did? Um, um the other the other sky one the gritty oh, skies dark skies dark skies dark skies Ooh, yeah. gritty gritty skies i want to see that movie gritty skies <laughs> it sounds like an Where early uh, the... oliver stone movie or something yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no it's gritty skies it's just the that um uh uh hockey mascot gritty oh. or is that its name I don't know. It doesn't matter. I'm happy to be here. I'm thrilled to be here to talk to you, to talk about these movies. It's going to be great. It'll be fun. It'll be emotional. It'll be um, mm -hmm. traumatizing and everything. Yes. Yeah. I and mean, then we'll talk about the movies. Oh, yeah. Ish. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> if, if anyone can't tell, Andrew is a comedy writer. Boom. Oh, nah, nah. <laughs> so what's been going on in your world uh, during this continued lockdown of the world? Are you uh, staying busy? I have a feeling we're going to have a creative renaissance after this is all done. I, I friggin' hope so, man. Yeah, I've, it's, I've absolutely, I think that staying busy is a perfect way to put it. I've been just trying to write as much as humanly possible until I run out of ideas, which luckily hasn't happened yet working on uh, a, a pilot with a like a project pilot thing with an old teacher and good friend of mine um, which I'm very excited about uh, or just wrote another pilot on my own which was something that I just wanted to like get out there um, just trying to you know make sure that I don't like it to use my free time well because while New York is not the uh, war zone slash hellscape that some people have tried to claim that it is anymore. <laughs> right. Um, even though, I mean, I, I don't have to tell you, things were rough there for a couple months. We talked Ooh. about that last time we talked. But, you know, things have gotten a lot better, but it's still not like, you know, I'm not riding the subway every day or I'm not hopping around all over the place. And, uh, like, I, as far as my day jobs are concerned, none of that has come back yet. So I'm just trying to make sure that I stay productive and stay sane and watch movies my wife and i watch a movie almost almost like uh, almost every day if not every other day we'll just like all right it's dinner time let's 
watch a movie. And at first it was like a fun, like, oh, we'll try to like watch more movies this way. And as <laughs> we're in month six now, it's been like, all right, can we not watch a movie tonight? <laughs> can we? <laughs> I know it's a real feeling. champagne problem. It is, right? And I mean, I watched, I think, all six seasons of Lost within like a two week span. So wow. I will never get that time back. But um, no, 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 no. <laughs> I love Lost. It's my third time mm. watching it all the way through. And uh, um, I, I'm the same way, you know, it's like a movie a night or. 10 episodes of The Office for the one millionth time, but... Oh, dude, same. Yeah, yeah, it's comforting. And I think that's why a lot of people mm -hmm. watch these shows, Parks and Rec, yeah. The Office, over and over. Yep. I, I, you know, I, I put it on to go to sleep because you, yep. you know what comes next and it's comforting. And God forbid, like, we feel some sense of, you know, normalcy or comfort during mm -hmm. these uncertain times, so, yeah. Yeah, no, yeah, I, uh, I, at the beginning of this, watched through 30 rock um oh, God, and yes. now recently my wife joy has been watching it for the first time like watching through it she's oh, seen like episodes fun. here and there but yeah and i was just like oh cool i'll pop in whatever whenever or what have you because i've seen that show just an, a bunch it's one of my favorites of all time and instead i'm just i'm constantly just like oh you put on 30 rock i'll stop what i'm doing and come right over here <laughs> <laughs> like it's just it, you're right it's it's something it hits a little part of my brain where i'm just like hey you want to feel good for like 25 minutes <laughs> yeah yeah i know so, man i mean and i'm the next one on my list is uh this new show on netflix called away with uh ooh. hillary swank and it's about them ooh. Going to Mars for the first time, the first man Ooh. or woman, I guess, uh, ex, you know, expedition to Mars. So has sure. a lot to do with what we're going to be talking about today. Um, yeah. But I got to ask you, before we get to these two movies, the latest news that broke this week as of us recording this is um, on Monday, scientists, scientific researchers published showings of phosphine a possible signature of life present in the atmosphere of Venus. What do you think of this, man? Did you, uh, did you wake up to this n news just as surprised as the rest of us? I was totally surprised. I think I saw somebody put it perfectly, which is that like, because I even got like a little Apple alert on my phone. Uh, mm -hmm. The Apple news of just like signs of life discovered on Venus. And it's just this quick, like your heart palpitates a little bit. You're like, it's, it's, it's very exciting. But then when I looked into it, I was like, I don't know what this means. I'm going to wait until Thursday for Ryan to explain it. <laughs> um, so I was <laughs> kind of like stayed away from it. So what do, as someone who I'm sure looked into it much more than I did, what do you think? Well, it's exciting. I mean, a lot of, you know, it's not the aliens are on Venus that we we're all right. hoping for or ever expected. I mean, Venus was not a planet that most scientists ever thought could harbor life. It's so damn hot that it oh, would be really? impossible for anything to mm -hmm. really live there, according to our standards and our, you know, uh, carbon makeup, as it were. So, sure. I mean, it wasn't somewhere they were looking, but lo and behold, they they found these gases floating in the clouds in the atmosphere there, and uh, they believe that there are signatures of phosphine, which shouldn't exist there. And the scientists are completely dumbfounded and uh, surprised, and just like we are, they're like, "What the f?" Like we we we've been searching for life elsewhere in other galaxies, but we never right. thought we would find it in our own solar system. So, hey, look, it's early stages, but it's exciting nonetheless. And it shows that, you know, just because we don't think it could exist or thrive somewhere else uh, because of how we were evolved and all of that uh, doesn't mean it can't exist. So this is pretty exciting. I'll add this. NASA, they... Uh, they have an extensive astrobiology program that is always searching for life. And um, mm -hmm. they were quoted on this story as saying, um, you know, we look for life in many different ways across the solar system and beyond. Over the past two decades, we've made new discoveries that collectively imply a significant increase of the likelihood to find life elsewhere. I'll add this too. As with an increasing number of planetary bodies, Venus is proving to be an exciting place of discovery. And uh, there are missions now uh, going 
to Venus to try to capture this man, see if we can get any more information. And it is possible. Well, that's, Venus, how, that's how some horror movies start. Uh, um. yep. <laughs> yep. And hey, look, we have brought back things from Mars or uh, you know various other places where there have been signs of life. So it's a little creepy, man. I mean, you know, that mm-hmm. stuff breaks free and gets out. Right. That's how you have, sure. like you said, these Michael Crichton stories right. popping up. Right oh, yeah, that's right. right. So it kind of leads into what we're going to be talking about today, the possibility of alien life and the possibility of making contact. So we're going to start with 1996's The Arrival, directed by David Tui. Station 5. Is my voice even vaguely familiar to you, Zane? I really don't want a repeat of last week. Look, if I say I'm going to be there, I will be there. End of story. There is nothing more important to me right now than that. Searching for ETs in this political environment is a tough sell. I come to you with the possibility of extrasolar life. I could hand for it. They're acting like it never happened. It's like we never gave him any tape. The first signal is definitely sky-based, but this one is Earth-based. Something's going on here, Sean. What is it that they're trying to hide? a troubled young man. Why are you telling them lies about me? I want my tape back. I want it back. They've branded his theory paranoid. There are some DOD guys here going through our stuff. I don't know who these guys are, but I do know that they're lying to you. And the only ones who believe what's coming. If they're not here now, they will be soon. Who's they? Are the ones who've already arrived. Right now, as much as you think you know, you don't know the half of it. Why did they leave? They didn't. How do you know? Because we aren't dead yet. Move! Stop watching the skies. I know why they're here. Start watching your back. Charlie Sheen, Ron Silver, The Arrival. Like I said, Z, you didn't know the half of it. Now, before we get to the premise of this movie, Andrew, David Tui, do you know anything about this guy? I don't. I saw that it was written and directed by, and I didn't I didn't dig too much deeper. I, think, okay. I feel like I almost did. Um, this was one... Uh, I'll get into my watching experience of both of these movies in a minute, but um, uh, yeah, I didn't, but I, you know, anybody who's able to write and then direct or direct a movie that they wrote is a hard enough thing to be given. Anyway, you have to have at least usually some sort of a proven track record, unless you're Madonna. Um, but <laughs> it's, and that is not even, that is like half a joke. That's really happening. I know. Um, uh, but so I was kind of, in, in, I was like, oh, somebody wrote and directed this. Interesting. Um, what, 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 do you, what do you know about him? All right. Well, talk about a track record. You ready for this? David Tui. Sure. He wrote mm-hmm. Pitch Black, G.I. Oh, Jane. Oh, so after this then. Yeah. Oh, yeah. wow. Uh, what else? Waterworld. You're going to like these last two though, Andrew. Wait a minute. <laughs> you think that's bad? Wait, wait for this. I think you like this movie, if I can, if I remember correctly. The Fugitive. He wrote The Fugitive. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Fine. You know what? I yes, I love that. It's a great movie. <laughs> and last but not least, he wrote Critters Two. Yeah. <laughs> wow. So yeah, he's okay. no slouch, man. Wow. I was about to say it does not surprise me because I think Fugitive probably would have been a couple, like probably two or three years before this went into production. Mm -hmm. And he was, I'm sure, a hot property after that. That movie blew up. It was huge, huge, huge. Mm -hmm. Let's get to the the cast here before the premise. We've got pre-insane crazy version of this man. We've got Charlie Sheen. Lindsay who is was my same age when he made this movie Are which you really yes he was 31 years old unless i read that incorrectly he was born in 1965 and when i read that he was 31 years old i was like i don't know if he looks bad or if i look great because <laughs> i like <laughs> 
Dude, trust me, the older you get, the more of those existential uh, comparisons you'll start to make. Yeah, or or vice versa. I was like, maybe he looks great and I look bad. Because at first, at one point, Ron, um, Ron Silver calls him a young man. And I was like, Charlie, she's like 45 years old in this movie. And then I looked it up and I was like, oh, <laughs> oh god don't remind me man uh who else we got lindsey kraus um who i'm not lindsey kraus yes who's she i i looked her up because i thought that was char at first but it's not it's the green woman because and she's had a pretty expensive career um not this not that this defines her but she was married to david mamet for a while oh um and, and yeah and has like a bit like that's a heavy her and richard schiff both being in this movie those are and rod silver there's some heavy hitters actor wise in this movie yeah there are i know what a great cast and you know what Mm -hmm. honestly uh besides our main protagonist which we'll get to uh Mm. pretty damn well acted in my opinion they really gave their all yeah Yeah, no everybody there's definitely something to be said for the fact that like everybody was taking the movie seriously Yes. Um, which always helps, whether <laughs> good or bad. <laughs> you want people to like, especially when it comes to like heavier themes. Um, and it's also something where I would wonder because the movie was, um, ironically enough, too, especially because um, having Ron Silver, who was at the time a Democrat, but the movie is very liberal um, and yeah. progressive in its message. It's talking about climate change, they take a shot at the NRA at one point. They say global warming at a time when I was like, this is 1996. Like, you didn't, I, if you talked about global warming, you got laughed off. Like, I mean, there was some of that happen, talk was happening, but like, it wasn't, you know, that was, I would almost call it like just as fringe of a belief as like believing in aliens. Right. It was, it was definitely this, this premise and overall theme of this movie was definitely, I think, ahead of its time. Um, and a lot of people have compared this and the other movie we're going to talk about to, uh, you know, the groundbreaking film uh, Contact, you know. Oh, sure. And very similar sort of premise, but this movie came two years prior to that. So, I mean, you yeah, know, you, gotta, you gotta give credit where credit's due. They were kind of pioneering this idea of the uh, making contact with aliens via the actual way in reality that we are trying to do that and that's through you know the search for extraterrestrial intelligence SETI uh trying to look for radio wave transmissions or stuff like that so I think you know again original idea at the time yes we've had many movies throughout the decades of trying to make contact with aliens and this and that but um you know, right. I, I, and even before this film, we had My Stepmother is an Alien, which deals with a very similar way of contacting aliens. And it's funny you mentioned Contact Company, because I would think of Contact being um, both quality and like kind of in the middle of both of these movies. I actually saw Contact for the first time this summer. I had never seen oh, that wow. movie. Really? Yeah, yeah. Um, yep, just had never seen it. And I watched it and I was like, oh, like there's plenty, like there's a lot of it that's really good. And, and a lot of like, you know, there's some stuff that hasn't aged like super well. Um, but one thing that that movie has over both of these is that it has Jake Busey in it, and I, I don't get enough. I don't get enough Jake Busey in my life. Um, oh man, could you imagine if Jake <laughs> Busey was in this movie with Charlie Sheen? It oh, off the charts! Insane. It would have been so good. Like I, I, hey, I'll throw a pitch out. I would have rather had Jake Busey in it instead of Charlie Sheen. Uh, <laughs> There's, let's do it. Retroactive movie. Yeah. Go. yeah, right? Yeah, we'll do one of those deep fake things. They've got basically the same kind of haircut. What is going on with this haircut? I don't want to, like, listen. Listen, it was 1996. There's a lot of different, but I was like, I don't understand this man's weird, like... The buzz stuff. cut? It's almost like a haircut that, like, started as a buzz cut. It's like if you take long hair and make it a buzz cut, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, it's not a close, close cut. It's just, it's... It was an odd look for him. Somebody who was, and who knows, maybe this still would have been the case, but I feel, you know, Charlie Sheen was a bit of a sex symbol for a while. And to oh, see him like that? this, to see him like this, I was like, huh. I was like, maybe they're trying to dumb him down because he is a, what would his prote- um, exact title be? Like a radio astrologer or astronomer? Astronomer, yep, exactly. It's just astronomer, but wasn't that, I feel like he added some extra qualification because he's an astronomer that's looking for sound waves. He's not looking for like constellations or anything. 
Right, right. They all add, you know, credits, uh, all these sure, scientists sure. that they are. But, um, you know, the official synopsis calls him a radio astronomer. I, I don't know. Gotcha. Um, he's not an astrobiologist or astrophysicist or anything of that sort. Um, so, yeah, I, I guess I would just go with radio astronomer. Gotcha. Not, let's not- Speaking of that, do you want me to read the synopsis? Yes. Or the, or the, yeah. Let's do it. So we have The Arrival. Zane, an astronomer, discovers intelligent alien life, but the aliens are keeping a deadly secret and will do anything to stop Zane from learning it. Love it. Love it. Let's let's kind of, uh, let's dive right in, man. I want to talk about this opening scene because I actually love this hook. Like, this is like the cold open you'd see on the X-Files or, um, sure. you know, the Outer Limits or something. We yeah, the, 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 whole, the whole thing felt very, like, he makes a Tales from the Dark Side reference at one point. Yeah, And did. the whole story felt, felt very much like that to me, it like did. a longer episode. Yep, it did, it did. It felt like it could have been, uh, you know, shaved down to 45 minutes and called it a day. But uh, right. they stretched this thing out to almost two hours. Jesus Christ. Um, Bro, right. and Oh, I mean, it was even more than that because I watched it for free on Blue Oh, Stone God. TV, so you got all the- And it had commercials. Oh, my God. It was like, I, I think I was texting you at like two. It's like, what, what time? It's like 345 right now. I was texting you at 2.45, having mm-hmm. pretty much just finished this movie oh, because I God. started it at around like noon. And, I, and then I was like, oh, no, because I wanted it to be fresh because I had never seen it before. Um, so you're going to have plenty yeah. to say then. You're gonna oh, have boy. Well, let's talk, about the, uh, I, uh, let's talk about the opening yeah, scene. Yeah, let's talk about the opening. Sure. Uh, this um, woman who we learn is mm-hmm. uh, Ilana Green. Mm-hmm. She is a uh, climatologist. And sure. she is in a field uh, taking photos, picking out some, some poppies, a poppy field, as it were. And, uh, mm-hmm. and then we get the line, it shouldn't be here, which is like, okay, why? And then what do we do? Do a super zoom out. And she's mm-hmm. like the tundra, the Antarctic or yeah. something like that, which, yep. whoa, when I didn't remember that opening scene, because I saw this movie when it first came out or was put on VHS. And um, mm-hmm. I don't remember this opening scene having as much impact, probably because I was too young to understand what global warming sure. and climate change actually was. Because like you said, it wasn't taken seriously back then. Um, so when they zoomed out and it was in the Antarctic and I watched it this time, I'm just like, holy shit, we are living this right now. Like look yeah. at San Francisco, look at everything, all these horrible things going on in the world uh, environmentally and Oh, it was terrifying. So in that yeah. scene, I think the message of this movie, which we will get to, is very vital. Um, just Yeah, man. Yeah, it was one of those things where I, I, I really liked that opening hook and then was just like, oh, cool. So they're going to be going up the Arctic, huh? No. Nope. Like, it's, <laughs> it's just like, uh, we'll show you that. Give you no, at least unless I missed something, there's no real explanation as to She's in the middle of Antarctica when they pull back. Right. How? How? How, <laughs> How did she get all the way out there? She's got no, like, I, I was just kind of flabbergasted by that. I was like, this is a cool hook. But then it, like, the whole, the whole movie to me kind of rested on some of these ideas that are, like, fun to present and then have, like, no follow-up or no, like, really, like, there's there's stuff about it later. Like, if you think about it for more than two seconds, it makes no sense. Oh, absolutely. Um, the, the logic <laughs> of this movie is just... It's a, all over the place. It's all over. Um, and we'll hit some of those plot points for sure. Sure. Um, all right. So then we get our opening titles. All right. Sorry. <laughs> God, I'm going to be doing this so much tonight. The Arrival. Right. There we go. <laughs> um, <laughs> and we meet... Now, uh, we meet Zane and we meet Kelvin, the uh, the yep. odd couple of radio astronomy. <laughs> and uh, I, I, yeah, now that, that that signal comes, so they're they're doing the radio astronomy biz. Yep. They have happen what anyone in their position only dreams of, right? Oh, like absolutely. that's their their life's mission is to find something like this to happen. And the way they react felt like they were reacting to like, 
like their favorite song just came on the radio or something like that. <laughs> push you know record, what I push mean? Record. Yeah, they were just like, yeah, woo, woo. Like they just, it was, it seemed like such a strange, I was like, guys, you should be like, I, 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 I cry at the drop of a hat. So I don't assume that everybody should just be like in tears, but I'm like, this is what you wanted. This is yeah. what you've been working your whole life towards. Like, and it's happening right now. And it just kind of like, it's not even like, it's like a stunned reaction. I mean, Richard Schiff pees on his shoes a little bit. Um, <laughs> but there's like, aside from that, I'm just like, guys, this is like, this is it. And they're just like, yeah, okay, record, record. Like, and they get it and then it stops. And they're like, oh man, all right. Got to go talk to Ron Silver like the next day. Like it just. Yeah, <sighs> my, here's my argument to that. Um mm-hmm. And I'm not defending their acting choices or anything. Um, right. From a character standpoint, I'm thinking, you know, yes, they they wait for this their whole life, but they get so mm-hmm. many like, false positives when it comes sure. to stuff. You know, and I've, sure. I've spoken Fair to enough. actual people who worked at SETI. And, dude, like, yeah, they get little small blips here and there um, constantly. And then their job is to either figure out what it actually was. And it's usually always a radio wave or television wave bouncing back right. at us um you know from our you own know what R- retracted i retract my criticism of that then so they're they're trained to kind of keep cool when these things do happen in, in my opinion i think that's what was going on in the scene is they're like okay we need to follow protocol like just make sure it's recording make sure this um let's deduce this uh so that's kind of how i took it i also think charlie sheen is just a terrible actor but we will get to that uh but, yeah but you do make a good point like okay we're dropped into this movie where for uh, probably for most of their careers this has never happened and then of course the minute the film drops us in there it happens which is you know that's right. what movies and plays are we're of dropped course. into the lives of these people at the most mm-hmm. you know, pivotal moment of their lives and this is probably right. it so um yeah so they get this message and they are not sure what the hell to make of it it's this really weird radio wave signal audio and like you said they they're super excited they get all of the data down this that this that and um they're trying to call other you know, radio astronomers throughout the country to make sure someone else heard this and and they can't get a hold of anyone, which I thought was kind of weird. Like there's got to be somebody else out there hearing this or listening. Right. Or right. you're just telling me every university or astronomer is asleep right now while this is happening. <laughs> you know what, uh, though? At least they do the due diligence to say like, oh, try reaching out to this person. They didn't answer. Oh, this person didn't answer either. So I'm like, okay, at least they answered that question of just like, why is no one else hearing this? But yeah, it is kind of silly for that answer to be like, they're asleep. Because <laughs> we're the only ones uh, that are taking this seriously. Like, so it's just, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think, w- you know, rewinding a little bit too, before they get the message, I think we have to, um, we have to give them credit for this. They show how fucking boring it is for these people yes like they're just yes. waiting uh calvin is asleep uh drooling mm-hmm. and then we've got we've got zane whose girlfriend calls him and says when are you coming home like i like th- this is her exact line i want your ass in bed <laughs> that's what she says to yes me. yes Which, uh, we'll get yes. to more of that uh moving uh, oh i mean again. some of the some of the dialogue is i one of my at one point she says to him uh put your paranoia back in your pants and i was just like oh, okay <laughs> like, oh, I, dude, some... i've got direct quotes written down where these are gonna yeah be yeah so okay so f- this message they get it's like 45 seconds long and like you mentioned uh they bring it to their boss at uh jpl the jet Propa- propulsion laboratory in california and dude this Classic. place has like a super strong mythology within um really ufo world and uh the occult world as well um the dude who started jpl was working with like weird satanists and occultists before he started this company um what really weird like like really like proven like that oh god yes yes wow if you go back i think it was even um on drunk history when they covered they covered like the beginnings of nasa and jet jpl and they did cover this um oh god i the guy's name is escaping me right now but he was big into occultism in america Amazing. He lived in new york city 
And the guy who started JPL was like in this weird love triangle with this guy and his wife. And they did all these weird sex rituals and like just super strange stuff, man. And then he went on to form like one of the most uh, prestigious jet propulsion places in the world. So yeah, really, really weird. But some of these companies are steeped in. Yeah. But um, moving on from that, <laughs> they go to their boss to give this news. And um, who, did, who was this again? Their boss? Ron Silver is his name. And what do I know somebody is he's all he was all over the place, especially in the nineties. Um you ever see Time Cop? He's the bad guy in Time oh, Cop. Oh yes. Yes. Um and he was noted for he was a Democrat at this time. I was looking this up because I I thought I was like, oh man, it must have been weird for him to be in this movie because he was uh so he is he, essentially he was somebody who uh was a Democrat until 9-11 happened and then he thought the democratic response to that and terrorism was not strong enough so he became an independent started supporting george bush was working hand in hand with george bush um up until his death in 2009 however it was um it was revealed by his brother like a year after his death uh that he had voted for Obama because he very much wanted to see an African American president. So he had an interesting, like, last wow. decade of his life. Yeah, interesting, a real interesting guy. But you can see, like, if somebody was like a Democrat, it almost made me start wanting to look into the like political line li- leanings of everybody in this movie, especially the director, because again, like, it's yeah. just very much like it's very, very much a progressive movie. It has its missteps, like Kiki. Um, uh, or get the, to that. <laughs> yep. Yeah, um, but you know, it's like the the overall message of the movie centering on climate change in a time when like mainstream, like you know, Independence Day doesn't even really get into it. like a lot of those mainstream action movies and stuff, especially in the '90s, are like apolitical. Yeah. Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes, yeah. That's a good point, though, and I think that might be why this movie didn't do as well uh, for yeah. many reasons, but I think this is one yeah. of them, is it did have a strong stance on things that not all Americans or not all humans agree with, and that's right. hard when, you, when yeah. you're kind of putting your foot down in your film and saying, this is my message, this is my theme. Right. Um, I think it's interesting, and again, we'll get to why – global warming plays such a big part in this but um okay so they gave so Z- yes because i will need you to explain it to me because there were a couple of times i, I can't pretend Sorry. to know it all but we will Ooh. try um zane and uh calvin bring this information to their boss at uh jpl slash i guess they're kind of working with nasa they're not you know directly related but uh their boss is like i i i don't know what you want me to do with this um like also, you're fired. <laughs> so right, it's like, right. You bring him, and I think Zane actually says, I bring you the most groundbreaking discovery we've had in forever, and you're firing me? And yeah. uh, she's like, what the hell is going on here? Why would it, your it, boss it, do this? It's even more confusing because that starts with him being like, there's nothing here. Oh, oh, you mean the signal came on and then it didn't repeat, and then we didn't see it again? And then moments later, he's like, this is a huge scientific find. This is exactly what you've been looking for, but I got to let you go. I'm just like, what? We, we just took like a big shift. <laughs> yeah, it was a very unbalanced uh, scene, I would say. But yeah. uh, so he fires, fires Zane, and then we see mm-hmm. his boss destroy the tape. So right. what's going on there? We'll get to it. Um, mm-hmm. What else here? Oh, and then um, so Zane... He's fired and he kind of, you know, he tells his girlfriend and we come to find out, yeah, he's been doing this job forever. He's kind of lacked in the boyfriend department and the relationship is very strained in many ways. Uh, Mm -hmm. But he does immediately, God, wouldn't this be nice? You get let go from a job and then like days later you get another job. But uh, he starts working for like a satellite company, you know, very run of the mill, blue collar job. Does he? Because yeah, why do you for somebody? Well, because I was confused all of a sudden. Like, and I, let me be very clear about something. I was gonna say this. I was the. I watched both of these movies in the last twenty four hours. Okay? okay, so last night, last night I was a little tired. 
Um, and I put on Arrival. I was like, I, I might fall asleep cause, just because I was like, beat. it was a long day. But I was like, you know what? I've seen this movie a bunch. I really like this movie. I put it on. I it, uh, it And I couldn't look away. Like, I, I was woken up by that movie. I love that movie. I was attentive the entire time I watched it. I put this on today. I woke up this morning. I went for a run. I came back. I had, like, I had breakfast. I had two big cups of coffee. I had to write an article for uh, Pajiba.com. No big deal. Check out Pajiba. And I... <laughs> um, smooth. I, smooth. Very smooth. Um, and then I put this movie on. And I'm like, all right, I'm ready to pay attention to a movie. When I tell you that this thing, I had the hardest time staying engrossed in this movie. <laughs> and so at a certain point, I, and Joy watched it with me, at a certain point, I looked at the TV and I was like, wait a minute, is he a handyman now? Because all of a sudden he starts running, he runs into that little, um, uh, the uh, TED talk or whatever it is that the guy is attending, right? Yeah. yeah. And that his former boss is attending. And he's mad because he found out that like he didn't share the tape. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And he's got that outfit on and the name tag isn't his name. And then that becomes a recurring thing as he's like working on other people's satellites. Yeah. So I just started to wonder, I was like, is this a real, did I, it, and this could have happened. Did I miss the scene where he's just like, well, I got this job now, or well, I got to do this for money now. Or did he just all of a sudden had this van and several different name tags and outfits. Holy shit. I didn't even, I didn't, yeah. Where's the, um, where is the connector between that? I don't know. That's a really good point, man. Like, he, and, it wasn't and if I missed name. it, yeah. If I missed it, if somebody wants to start flaming me on Twitter, that's fine. Like, <laughs> that's why you got to really pay attention to a movie. But I swear to God, it was like, I, cl I blinked. And all of a sudden, he's rushing into this place with his outfit on. And I was just like, oh, okay. Yeah. So he's pretending to be a handyman to get in there. Um, and then I was like, wait, what's, why is that not his name? Like never once did he wear a name tag that says Zane on it. Right. Zane Zeminski. Z that's <laughs> that's it's, some classic, classic name stuff going on. That was a Stan Lee name right there, man. Yeah, for real. Yes. <laughs> Matt Murdock, Peter Parker. I yep. could go yep, on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Bruce <laughs> Banner. It's all, it's all, this is superheroes in general. Yeah, you could um, tell this writer definitely was a comic book fan. Um, yeah. That's such a good point. Um, okay, well, you know, let's let's suspend our our uh, disbelief for a Done. moment and say Done. Um, he <laughs> he's working for some satellite repair company. So mm -hmm. fell, yeah, fell on hard times. Fell on some hard times. Us. It really does. And you know, just like any guy, when you're that beaten down and and whatnot like it starts to take a toll on you and uh mm -hmm. you know you don't feel your wor self-worth anymore but before he loses all self-worth we get our first shot of zane post coitus i think or pre-coitus yeah, yeah, i can't yeah. really tell well out on his dock <laughs> his dock his, he's not fishing out that's, on his deck his dock, yep. yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah um in the news well, what do so you think he... andrew well, here's a question for you, Ryan. Why was he wet, and why was she not? <laughs> he was very was, uh, perspiring. Yes, for se during several points of the movie, to the point where I almost thought, like, not to jump ahead too far, but there's later on where he's wearing a disguise that starts to fail, and it looks like he's sweating through it. Yeah, and I was like, have they been showing him being perpetually sweaty? for this entire movie just to set up that one bit? Because if so, that's almost kind of genius. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> then they don't get into, like, they don't elaborate on whether or not that's why the costume was failing. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I saw that scene happen, and I was just like, wait, why is he wet? And yeah. why is she not? I was like, she. it seemed like maybe she was getting out of the shot. I don't know. Yeah, I don't I, know. that was something where I was just like, there were several times where I said out loud, what is this movie? Yep. Yeah. What is it trying to be? And we'll definitely get to that because it it's it's trying to be a lot of different things. But um, mm -hmm. so okay, so we get our first scene of uh, of his more of his body than I think any of us truly wanted to see. But like you said, he was kind of a sex symbol back then, and I guess right. I I guess right. I kind of blacked that out of my memory. I don't sure. remember <laughs> many films he did. I did watch the Hot Shots movies. Uh, oh really? What was that other big was, one he did? Platoon? 
Was is that his? Um, no, he was in. Uh, oh man, he did one of those like Vietnam movies. Trouble. Yeah. Yes, I don't want to. It might have been Platoon. I don't think it was Full Metal Jacket. No. Um, no. But it was. Hold on, I'm gonna pull up his Wikipedia right now because we're just gonna be those kind of people. Exactly. Um, people because it's easier that us. way. Oh, it was Platoon. Yeah, you oh, know. Okay. It. Okay. And I saw, I definitely saw the Hot Shot. I loved Hot Shots Part Two. So funny. Growing so, up. So um, funny. And a Major League, which the major, he was in the first two oh my major God, league dude. movies, I think. And I loved those. Yeah, what was his name in that? Uh, oh, shoot. Uh, let me see. Wild Thing. Rick Vaughn. Wild, Wild Thing, yeah, Rick yep, Vaughn. Yeah, 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 yeah. Dude, I didn't yeah, even wow, look that up. I, I was yeah, obsessed I was with, <laughs> um, I was obsessed with Major League Two. So much so that, uh, the Cleveland Indians became my team after I saw oh, that's awesome. the, uh, that's the first awesome. movie. And I, I only like them because of these movies. So there's, there's your allegiance right there for a baseball mm-hmm. team. Oh, in this scene too, we should mention on the shelf uh, in, I think his bedroom, we get a shot of Carl Sagan's Cosmos book, which is what the movie oh, nice. Contact is based on. So there's a little, right, right, right. nice little Easter egg or homage right there. Sure. Yeah, I I almost feel like like it was it was like a race to do movies about that kind of stuff in the like yeah. the late eighties into the nineties, um, and it wasn't until you do one because I would argue like of the three that we met, mentioned, um, this uh, contact and my stepmother is an alien. Um, contact is the most uh, successful um, of those movies that yes. that direct directly like. You like they jokingly. Ha- I think Carl Sagan, like it, Carl Sagan's voice, quote unquote, but it's actually Harry Shearer, um, is in um, uh, My Stepmother is an Alien. And then you have the book in this movie, and then you have the actual. I think Carl Sagan died like right before Contact came out. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. Like, I think it's dedicated to him. So it's 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 not until you get the actual man's formula going that you have more of a success story. But you right. know, yeah, that's a really, really good point. Um, Okay, so, all right, whatever. They're, they're, it's clear that he's a very insecure guy. His yep. girlfriend's trying to build him up and be like, I think you're special, and, like, you've always had conviction, but, like, you got to just accept this and move on. Like, it, right. it was a fluke, you know, this, that. But he's convinced, like, he heard something. He found probably one of the biggest things in in history, a message from aliens. So... What does he do? He uses what we're saying was his new job as a repairman for satellite dish, like a dish sort of situation. Mm -hmm. This is pretty cool. He goes to all these houses to quote unquote repair their satellites and he makes it so they all triangulate to like one specific coordinate so that he can now do what he was doing at his old job from I'm guessing the attic of his house. And, uh, and set this up. So now he's got his own little mini SETI radio astronomer headquarters in his house. This is pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, no, yeah. And it was one of those things too, where I, um, I, I like, I like at the beginning, like there are moments where this movie where I was like, Oh, I like where this is heading. Like, this is an interesting kind of like, you know, um, like let's see. And, and it, it, it I made the mistake of watching Arrival first because Ooh, I can't, that, I can't that was your lie. Yeah. Yes. Yep. I can't lie and say that I wasn't like projecting on this movie, but I was like, oh, cool. Maybe he's going to try to still contact these aliens despite being fired from his official position. Like he's going to try to do like almost like the opposite of what's done in Arrival where he's not getting government support and he's just trying to, he's like, well, damn, like government damned these things are going to try to talk to or trying to talk to us and I'm going to try to talk to them. Um, and then instead it just gets much more confusing. <laughs> it, does. <laughs> it does. You know, what confused me too, were those uh, steampunk sunglasses he was rocking this whole film. Bro. Oh my God. I'm so glad you just said something. <laughs> I, Oh, holy shit. Those look so awful. And it's so so nineties. And what's what's even worse is at one point I feel like they were using the sunglasses to show us that like he's over the deep end because when we see him like over the deep end, he's got these weird giant yellow sunglasses. Yeah, yeah. And like then, but there's yeah. one point where he's got uh, both of them like hanging from his necklace uh, or shirt. He's got two uh, pairs. Like, what is going on with this guy? I, like, I think what you're the 
fuck, man. He's just losing it, dude. He's losing yeah. it. Yeah. And that's a big part of this character, we should mention. He is very paranoid in many parts of his yes. life. And he has a yes. reason to, clearly. For uh, mm-hmm. But when it comes to him and his girlfriend, dude, like, what a piece of shit, possessive yeah. asshole he was. Yep. I yep. mean, like, he's accusing his girlfriend of cheating on him um, because a guy talked to her at one point. And I'm just right. like, this is the kind of guy you have to stay away from. Because, A, yes. Zane is not in a good place. And, B, Charlie Sheen acting this part, it looks like he wants to beat the shit out of everyone he talks to. Yeah, yeah. At a moment's that's notice. True. <laughs> and it's one of those things, too, where you're watching it and you're just like, so wait, why is he, like, it's almost like, did we miss a scene? Did the young, like, the dude who's, like, 10 years old, younger than the both of them, like, uh, like say something untoward to him earlier? Has he heard about him before? Right. Or was that literally just a random guy at her office? And he's like, yeah, is he going too? Like, right. you're just going to go. Or when, in the very beginning, he's on the phone call, don't talk to any strangers on your way out of the bar. Like, oh, like and she he's pissed that little. she's out at a bar. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. He's like, you're out at a bar while I'm at work. It's like, motherfucker, you don't know her. She, maybe she's not working right now. What's she yeah. supposed to do? Wait at home for you? Right. Like, when can she go to a bar by herself? He's not a likable lead by like no. any stretch of the imagination. Which makes it a slog to follow him through this. But um, yeah, the yeah, only dude. thing that really kept me going was, you know, I've been there. I'm, I'm, I, you know, shout from the rooftops every day, like, UFOs are real. Please, somebody believe right. me. And, yeah. you know, that's kind of happening in today's society. We're getting closer and yeah, closer man. in many ways. So I understand that need and want for people to, you want vindication. And um, mm-hmm. he's been put smack dab in the middle of this huge conspiracy, and uh, and no one will believe him. So I understand that. But this is just a poorly, poorly written character. And um yeah. And on top of having an actor who doesn't understand it, it just makes it even worse. But um, let's uh, yeah, okay. No, so, there were several times where he's like ringing off, like saying certain like jargon as far as being a, like a radio astronomer, and I was just like, you don't know anything that you just said. You have no idea what you're saying. <laughs> you like, know, do a little research. You know, it's really funny. Um, before we go any further, so I told before we got on, I told you I was writing down notes. Um, I've got one two three four five i've got six full pages for the arrival which makes no sense two for arrival. how does that happen how does that it's happen? because one one movie makes sense and another one doesn't like and okay. there's something to to be said about the fact that arrival is very minimalist yes. it's a big budget like big like it's it's a big movie but it's still like in the grand scheme of things we're in like three locations. We're at her college. We're at the um, the site where everything's going on, and we're inside the ship. Aside from that, we really don't go anywhere else. This movie, for some reason, goes fucking everywhere. Antarctica, a, California, yeah. Mexico, uh, Mexico, back to California, back, back to, to California. like the middle of the <laughs> desert, I guess. Like just all these things where I'm just like none of this. Yeah. is like helping and it's probably why the movie cost 25 million dollars to make holy for shit. some reason in 1996 yeah. oh you know where most Whoa. of that went to to our man oh yeah, yeah yeah but um oh yeah yeah <laughs> and the and the uh the stunning special effects which we will get to um <laughs> let's get back to i guess our next character we're introduced to andrew and i know you're gonna have a lot to say about this and i'm Ooh. going to i'm going to shut up about it um Let's get to it. So he's got his little radio astronomy makeshift thing in his house, and someone's spying on him from the window. And we are introduced yeah. to Kiki. Who is Kiki? Andrew? Yes, Kiki is a little black boy that lives next door, but doesn't really live next door. Uh, he's there because the place he comes from in LA is like super dangerous. So he's living with his grandma for a while. Um, he makes it very clear pretty quick that he's not packing heat. Because he's not like the other people at his school or whatever. It's just this. It's weird. When you find out, when there's a reveal about him later, it could almost be looked at as purposeful. Because both times, there's two things where I'm just going to jump ahead. Like, we, everybody knows there's going to be spoilers for this. Oh, yeah. Um, so just make that clear. Um, Kiki, it turns out, is an alien. 
And one of the other, the only other times where you get three interactions, like main interactions with people that end up being aliens. There's Ron Silver's character, his boss. Um, there is Kiki, and there is a stereotypical Mexican uh, cab driver. Mm-hmm. Um, now, I was very lucky enough to take my, for Joy and I to have our honeymoon in Mexico. We had several Mexican cab drivers and tour guides, and none of them spoke broken English the way that that character did. <laughs> uh, so it was one of those weird things where I was just like, oh, maybe it's just that the aliens, like maybe in some deeper way, the guy was trying to go like, oh, you know, if aliens come to this planet, they're going to be stereotypes of whoever they are. I, I, I feel like that's giving them too much credit. But it's also one of those tough things. It's like, listen, and we're, we're both, um, people will have probably heard Jamie Lamchick's voice at the beginning of this episode. And she uh, imparted a great bit of uh, uh, a, a great thing to me at one point within the last like year or two, where you can't, it's hard to have expectations on older movies to be culturally sensitive. Mm-hmm. It's just hard. You're fighting a losing battle. Some of the best movies have these blind spots and not saying that this is one of the best movies, um, but <laughs> some of the movies before anything before, like, I don't know, 2005 and that needle moves all the time where you're just like, well, at least if you see a movie after like 2010 and they don't do anything culturally insensitive, like you're in, or if they do do something culturally insensitive, you're just like, come on, man, we got black president. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's well, before that, like we're in 1996 is a time where like, I'm sure and and is it the most offensive portrayal of a little black boy? No, but it's pretty bad. It's, and it's, it's close. Pretty yeah. Much, yeah, it's pretty bad. Like he's talking about not packing heat. He's like an idiot. He's got his hat on sideways and wearing these big baggy clothes. And I know some of that was the style at the time, but like so was fucking Steve Urkel. So like you know <laughs> you can't like it, it, it's it, there's there's this idea where it's just like oh we got a little black kid yeah like you know you're talking jive you're just like he's like you want me to press this button right here this one that my fingers above like i'm just like what is happening right now <laughs> and then yo i have even oh my god i just realized something because he's an oh i'm i'm so confused about what kiki's role in the movie is Okay. Yeah. Let's see if it unfurls as we explore this extremely deep film. Um, let's see. <laughs> oh, yeah. Charlie Sheen does tell Kiki, shouldn't you be out tagging something? Jesus Christ. Oh, uh, yes. Oh, oh. And that was one where I was like, I hate you, Zane Zeminski. Like, I don't understand. Like, that's what you have to say. Like, and it's one of those tough things. It's, it's it, honestly, it's made even more glaring by the fact that, and unless I miss somebody, this is the only African American character in the film. Yes, it is. Yeah, the only one. Yeah. So it, it that's when you start to get to a point where it's like, well, what, what are we saying here? Like, yeah. This is, what is the this point? is how you're going to react to interact with the only black person? Like, I don't know. It's just it was it was pretty rough. That yeah. was that that made me like as a person of color. Um, I saw that happen and I was just like, this is, it's cringeworthy. It It really is. is. It's bad. Um, But again, I can only, I can only get so mad. It was 1996. (laughs) I like, it just, at a certain point, it just fucking is what it is. is. And (laughs) it's hard to, man. It goes, it always goes back to that whole, you know, debate we've, we've been having a lot lately with the Me Too movement and stuff like this. Mm -hmm. It's like, how, when, when can you separate the artist's work from like what Yeah. And that's such a hard thing with a lot of people. So I understand. I, I think I, I, you know what, you know what's funny? I think there was an interview with Chris Rock in the New York Times this week where he talked about the fact that Jimmy Fallon um, did a black faced impersonation of him in the year 2000, right? Mm-hmm. And which Jimmy Fallon came under fire for recently, um, something that was 20 years old. Um, and uh, Chris Rock was just like, just said that he wasn't offended by it. Uh, because A, he's friends with Jimmy Fallon and he likes him a lot, but also he said that the intent is very important, which is something that I, intent and context is something that often gets overlooked when people are trying to attack somebody for a certain reason. Yeah. Um, when it's not, like if you can have, like if you can line up intent and context and it's like you can tell that something is like meant to be hurtful or meant to be mean-spirited or meant to be offensive, that's when you start to come into problems. But it's when something 
is not done for those kind of reasons, that's when you have to go, well, what do we like? Is this the hill that we want to die on? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. This little kids, I, I do not think that the filmmakers were set out to be like, yeah, you know, he's going to be like a little, we're just going to like make fun of black people with this little kid. Like, I don't think that was the intention. Um, it's just something where it's, like I said, it's a blind spot. It's something where they, when you don't have any other black people on set or behind the camera, um, and probably the same, the same with Mexican people, you will find yourself doing things that you don't know were offensive. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, you just don't know. Yeah, that's a good point. Hindsight is always twenty twenty. But um Yeah, of course. Yep. All right. Well, let's I'm gonna try to breeze through some of these plot points because this yes. movie honestly doesn't yeah, yeah. deserve as much attention as our next one. But um yeah. <laughs> so Kiki and Zane, they get the signal back, which is fucking incredible. Like how yeah, the hell yeah. did that happen? But um amazing. And within the the message or signal, they hear Mexican music coming from a right a Mexican uh, radio station. So right. um, that's where we're at with that. And then meanwhile, uh, Kelvin, our other radio astronomer, uh, wakes mm-hmm. up and to his alarm and he goes to turn it off, but someone else turns it off. And then we mm-hmm. see that there are two men in suits in his bedroom and a uh, little creepy. And then boom, after Zane gets the signal, he goes to Calvin's to uh, be like, oh, my God, I got the signal again. I got the signal. And Calvin is dead. Um, yep. so something's going on. Something weird is going on. One, one of those men in suits, I have to have Leon Rippy is the man's name. Um, you'd know him if you saw if he's the one that, like, you see a little bit more of him later. Anyway, just classic character actor. Like, that's oh, cool. a guy you've probably seen him before. You'll see him again. Real good stuff. Um, I always remember him very uh, vividly from the movie The Patriot from the year 2000 with Mel Gibson. And, uh, yeah, Heath and Ledger. He, Heath Ledger. And yeah, yeah, yeah. That movie's, that movie's pretty stacked. But he's in there. He has a moment where he, like, blows his brains out when he finds out his family's been killed. Just, like, real solid stuff. He was in 11 This is one of the best Stephen King adaptations that's ever been made. If you've never seen that, check that out. Um, But just want to give a shout out to Leon Rippey. That guy's like, he's a, that's a classic character actor right there. Again, this cast is stacked. It really is. Um, Oh, yeah. Yeah. God, God. I just feel so bad for them, though. Um, Okay. (laughs) Hey, they got paid. They got Um, (laughs) paid. They probably got paid well, too. Nobody's career ended after this movie. Um, Except Kiki's. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, that's true. Yeah, you can't really find anything else on him. No, unfortunately. Um, (laughs) All right. So, clearly, there's a conspiracy going on. Kelvin's dead. Mm -hmm. Um, And then Zane decides to up and go to Mexico. Yay, because that's super easy when you live in California. Um, So, he does it. (laughs) And he gets there to try to figure out where this signal came from, um, a radio headquarters or something in Mexico. And then that's when our character from the beginning, Alana Green, comes back up and she pops up every now and again in different scenes talking about global warming global warming global warming global warming so her and uh and zane kind of end up in the same hacienda or something motel i'm not sure andrew you stayed at one of these places i don't know mexico oh yeah i think it's just a regular motel a hacienda is more of uh uh, when it's a little bit more secluded and it's just like a hacienda would be more of just like oh it's like several houses in one area that are all uh, like the same facility yeah they were just staying in like a hotel gotcha. um, no but no big deal i know um but <laughs> <laughs> i know you're talking to the guy who stays at budget inns yeah <laughs> um uh, yeah but so right just to, yeah just to like breeze through a little bit because i have to have I have a question, like, and this is one of the things where the movie starts to, I was happy that they didn't take the opportunity to, when he sees uh, Ilana Green for the first time, he does it like something catches his eye about her, I guess because she's another white person, um, <laughs> yeah. but, and, and, they're, and they're in Mexico, but I was just like, if he talks to her right now, I'm going to be furious, um, because I was like, it was the most coincidental meeting possible. Oh, yeah. Um, but he, he doesn't, they save that, so I was like, okay, that's fine. Um, but so he is, Later on, he's taking a bath because we got to see more Charlie Sheen chest. More, more. Please. And yes, and water starts dripping in. And then suddenly the tub falls from above him. It was actually like a fun, like, 
when it happened, I was like, oh, cool. And then it starts breaking through all the other floors. And I was like, <laughs> Looney wait, wait, Tunes, wait. man. Yeah, exactly. I was just like, what is this? But okay. <laughs> that was probably like, you know, uh, $50,000 you could have saved um, to not have that extra stuff happen, but whatever. Um, so they do that, and he chases this guy um, who's like, was there after, or like, who did that? And I, not to get like to this other point yet, but it's it's like an assassin, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. When he supposedly. later on, yeah, pulls another assassination attempt, he just puts a bunch of scorpions in someone's room. Yes, in Alana's room. Alana Green. So he goes from, I'm going to do the biggest, messiest thing possible to try to kill this person. To I'm just gonna leave some scor- scorpions here and like you know hope it all works hope it all works out for the best like why wh- wh- what he's a very uneven assassin for sure yeah and and he like regresses like yeah. you would think that it's like oh shit the scorpions didn't work well I'll try to drop a tub on him now yeah guess. like but no it's the other way around <laughs> it's so weird dude I, this. Oh, God. Well, yeah, okay. So we got Charlie Sheen chasing this assassin who tried to yeah. kill him with uh, five tubs going through floors of mm-hmm. the motel, hotel. And um, mm-hmm. he catches up to this guy, and all of a sudden, this this guy, the, the Mexican assassin, as it were, um, uh-huh. we get our first special effects in the movie where his... Yes, oh my God. And it took so fucking long to get to that. Uh... <laughs> Again, I was watching it with commercials too, and I, it would be one thing if the first like, 45, 50 minutes was paced a little bit better. But at one point, Joy, Joy was just like, not enough aliens for me so far, I'll tell you that much. And I was like, right? Yep. Like, what is happening? Why, where are the aliens? Yeah, um, which is funny because I'm actually the opposite. I wanted to, I wanted more of like the messages from space and like more of a. You know what? That would have been great too. Yeah, yeah, but instead we go straight sci-fi with this thing and this this mm-hmm. assassin. His 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 knees bend backwards. So imagine right. imagine that your knees going the other way, and um. And clearly, he's not human. He leaps about 200 feet over a wall and disappears. Mm-hmm. So clearly, we're dealing with something not human, supposedly. Uh, and he's kind of mystified. But but it's okay, because he still has to meet up with Alana. And uh, they need to talk about global warming some more. And uh, why they're both in Mexico. And they kind of become a team at this point, like trying to unravel mm-hmm. this stuff that's going on. Um, we get probably one of the most awkward flirting things ever when it comes to uh, yeah. these two, which again shows how much of a dirt bag. Uh, so yes. It yeah, it was so weird. He's not quite broken up with his girlfriend, but he's like, are we going to fuck tonight? Like, what's, yeah, the, it was so, what's the deal so here? Strange. Yeah. <laughs> With this, um, with Alana Green. So, uh, let's see. I'm gonna kind of fast forward here, Andrew. Um, yeah, that's totally fine. Um, right. <laughs> so, uh, Alana's out there doing some experiments and she gets arrested by the police. Zane just happens to show up when this happens and uh, mm-hmm. tries to stop the police. And who does he see but his boss? But it's not his boss because the guy oh. has a mustache. A mustache. Mm-hmm. So what's going on here? Um, so I, 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 well, that's an excellent question because <laughs> I have some like, because here's here's some, like questions. something I would like, yeah, I would like to ask you. So is the insinuation that it is literally just him in a mustache, or is the insinuation that these aliens are just like, yeah, we only got so many. Uh, alien skin or human skins to use. I think that's it, man. Because later in the film, he does say, "Like, yo, your aliens, they should have broke the mold when they made you, man." Because I uh, saw you yeah. in Mexico with a mustache. There you go. Boom. Perfect. Um, that's what I'm taking um, from it, at least. Okay, uh, good. That's fine. I guess I missed right. that line. Um, but I was just like, when that first <laughs> happened, I was like, even that, I was just like, that's kind of like, 
lazy. It I don't is. know. Like <laughs> it is. There's so much logic leaps in this movie. But um yeah. all right, let's fast forward. So this assassin puts scorpions in Alana's room, and I guess does she die? I didn't even notice. Like, is she gone? Eventually we learn that she is, but the last thing that we see happen to her is she sits up in bed and screams after they like tease the scorpion thing for however uh, many minutes. I think and I went the to the bathroom time, and left the movie playing at that point. Yeah, that, oh, I did that several times. Um, there, but I, um, so they do that, and then we jump forward later, and we see her corpse when he's arrested. Oh shit! I missed that whole part. He, yeah, because they like he's arrested, and um, the guy, the um, the police chief or captain or detective or whatever in Mexico is just like. Oh, yeah, you're going to see the, like, you know, it's like, well, somebody was hit a drunk drive. Because this is after he goes to the facility. Um, he hits Ron Silver's character with his car um, and then keeps driving. Because he goes into this deep alien facility underground thing, which is honestly, like, we can just skip that whole thing. Yeah, it was weird. <laughs> just know that he, uh, find, was, he finds this huge underground facility with all the right. Aliens. And they're doing this something. hidden plan. Yeah. And yeah. he runs it, and that's when he finds out that, like, you know, the cab driver that he had is also an alien. And he pushes him out of an elevator that doesn't have a door for some reason. <laughs> and, it, like, is able to, like, and puts on this really weird makeup at one point. And he finds out that these aliens, like, he sees aliens. And he's playing, like, action hero for whatever reason. And he sees aliens, and it was just like they're using these lights that give them um, skin. Oh, and I'm sorry, we can't skip it entirely, because here's another thing that doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. So the aliens stand in their little um, area to have the skin put on them, yeah. right? Yeah. When that happens, before they put the skin on, their body starts to change. And the things that show that their body is changing is their fingers get smaller, and their knees go to the way that a normal humans would. Right. So this has to happen before they put the skin on. <laughs> but then we see, but we had already seen pretty clearly that one of them is able to do that. And we see it again later with the human skin on and it makes no difference. So why, why even show us that that's what happens? Do, like, Andrew, why do not question our alien overlords. What are you doing? <laughs> And by that I mean, uh, I mean, um, uh, what's this guy's name again? David Toomey who wrote this. Do not question David Toomey, who I was just looking it up a little bit. I won't question him because he has written and directed not just Pitch Black but also Chronicles of Riddick yes. and Riddick, um, and is supposed to be making a new Riddick movie soon. So it's like you know what? I I don't have any successful franchises under my belt. So you know what? Like good on you. Oh God! Um, so yeah, so it's we're we're moving along. He he decides to go back to California because uh, he's escaping all the stuff that happened in Mexico. They use Alana Green's dead body to say that that's the person he hit um, instead of like using the body of a police officer, which seems mm -hmm. like would have been a little bit more effective. Um, and he goes back to california and now he's in crazy mode he's wearing a big black duster um he's got the crazy sunglasses on dude i gotta stop you here did you ever watch Please. renegade on usa renegade no. yeah it was it was like a bounty hunter show he was like okay. it was basically dog the bounty hunter but fictionalized and uh okay like 10 years earlier but it reminds me so much of this tv show like the duster and like he's all you know the desert. This is all what this show is about. So no, I, sure. I like this little. I'm guessing David Tui had something to do with Renegade too. But yeah, anyway, oh, sorry to interrupt. Okay. Continue. No, yeah, it's fine. Um, so he, yeah, so they go into. Um, he goes back to California. He find he first he calls out Ron Silver, and gets him to like admit what he was doing so he can like have it on tape. When when yeah. he when he meets up with his boss again, Ron Silver, and he says, "Hey, Zane, not looking so good." Best line of the movie: Zane says, "Actually, I look like a can of smashed assholes." 
<laughs> and that's when I'm like, what is this movie trying to do? What are we doing here? Yeah. Is this a yeah. comedy? Is it, uh, are we to take this seriously? Like, what the fuck is this movie? Yeah, like, that was one of those things where I remember when you first announced that we were going to be covering this movie on Twitter months ago. Uh, or, or somebody, that was the thing that everybody kept saying. They're like, oh, yeah, Candace Mask Assholes. And I'm like, yeah, is that the body you want to pull out of this car wreck? Like, that's what you're trying to say? You're just like, oh, but can't mash assholes. Like, so, so what? That means, that means nothing. It means absolutely nothing. I guarantee you that Charlie Sheen improv that line, and they were like, oh, Charlie. Oh, uh, fucking gold. Cut, <laughs> rap, print, save. Like, this is just done. We nailed it. Everybody you, go home. We'll pick back up tomorrow. Do you think he like, thought... <laughs> You think he thought, ah, oh, in 20 years, two guys during a pandemic <laughs> are going to be doing a review of this, and that's what they're going to talk about. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I hope so. I sure as shit hope so, man. Uh, uh. But okay, so yeah, uh, his boss, he he kind of admits, like, I'm not who you think I am, um, right. but you don't want to dig deeper. Like, this is going to be the end of you, brother. And um, Right. And he kind of does the evil boss thing and tells Zane everything, you know, yes. like, this is what we're doing here. And, and Zane is kind of like, I think I know what you're doing, but I'm not quite sure yet. Tell me. And, he, and he's threatening him with a fake gun. And mm-hmm. then we find out that he pulled a candid camera. It's like, there's a camera. There's a camera. There's yep. a camera. Yep. It's just one camera. But yes, he did record his boss telling him all this. So now Zane's got the proof. Silent invasion occurring. Yes, which I have questions. Okay. Because I am not sure what their plan. So are they trying to terraform the planet? Is that what's happening? So yep. they can come here? Yep. Okay. I, All right. Honestly, so simple enough. I think it's that simple. And I think what they're doing is, you know, we've got Alana Green saying global warming's real. Like this, you know, right. it's, it's gradual. And they're accelerating it. Yes. And they're accelerating it to the point where humans won't be able to live there anymore and they can take over the planet. So I think that's why they're, they have these terraforming things probably all over the planet. And it is, it's, Mm -hmm. it's underground, it's insidious. And that's kind of what global warming is in real life. You know, it's gradual until the point where we can't reverse it. So I think there is some good subtext going on here with how they sure. they handled it. Um especially towards the end, but we'll get to that. Mm-hmm. But um yes, I believe, you know, in the simplest of terms, the plan is that these aliens are disguising themselves in prominent places to uh to gain influence and also to terraform the planet and take it over. Right. Yeah. Um yeah. So uh, so yeah. He- yeah, so he meets up with Kiki again, who yep. Kiki saw. So at one point, the two guys that were in suits go to Charlie Sheen's place. They drop this little steampunk style looking ball. Hellraiser like, box, yeah. Hellraiser box. <laughs> yeah. That's what it reminded um, me of, and, anyway. Yeah, that's fair. No, and then it opens up, swallows everything in his apartment, and that's like, you know, gets rid of all his evidence. So him and Kiki, and Kiki are like, what are we going to do? And he's like, all right, we got to go to this satellite. That's yeah. elsewhere that we're gonna. I I couldn't tell what his exact purpose was there. I guess he's trying to broadcast. Yeah. So what so was happening? Basically, that tape that he had of his boss explaining right. the entire plan. Uh, and that's this is weird too. Like, does he really think this is the be all end all of evidence that this is going on? Is some you know, the movie saying... the movie does <laughs> the movie thinks the movie that. really does. It yep, does. I was I was pretty floored by that ending. I was like, yeah, guys. Oh, okay. that's it. Yeah. Um. Let, we'll get to that. Yeah. Uh. So yeah, Zane's plan is to broadcast this across the world using all these satellites, kind of like he did in the beginning where he triangulated everything to go to one place. He wants to now Mm -hmm. send this message out to humanity that aliens are trying to silently take us over. Um, Mm -hmm. So he kind of, you know, reconnects with his girlfriend. Uh, I feel so bad. What was her name? Char. Um, Char. Reconnects with her and uh, she kind of believes him, kind of doesn't. And she follows him and Kiki to the satellite place. And, um, they get there, and boom, the goons are back. His boss is back. But how did they get there so quick and know what he was doing, Andrew? I don't know. I, I, I got nothing. Like, and I, it was just one of those things, too, where 
Like that starts happening. Oh, wait, no, sorry. Ha ha. So they tease at first that Char is an alien. And I got to say, for a half second, I was just like, oh, you know what? That would be a fun enough twist, I guess. Yeah, yeah me too. Uh, yeah, but too. no, instead, it is kind of revealed, not fully yet, though, that Kiki is an alien. Right, right. So, so basically. And know, presumably tipped off Ron Silver and his goons as to where they were going. Yes. So Zane puts Kiki in control of pressing the red button, the quintessential mm-hmm. red button, to broadcast this message to the world. And uh, Kiki doesn't do it. Instead, he opens right. the door for our goons and our boss, our big bad alien boss, and to come in and stop Zane from doing this. Uh, right. So, yeah, we get these inklings that Kiki's not who we think he is. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, so Zane finds some some tanks of liquid nitrogen. He freezes all the aliens. He gets his tape back. Uh, am I missing anything before that? I don't think so. Uh, uh, no. Okay. No. Uh, oh, oh, there's some nitrous, nitroglycerin or whatever, nitrous oxide. Ni- um, what is it? The free, like something that was like, I feel like super popular in the 90s. It's like this. They do it in, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, um, uh, oh, shoot. Why well, can't I remember the name of I it? I have no idea what you're trying to say. Um, Demolition Man. Oh, uh, the stuff yes, that yes, freezes yes. you instantly. <laughs> that movie was awesome. Um, oh, man. Liquid nitrogen. But, liquid nitrogen. Thank you. Like something, I feel like that was something that was like popular in the 90s, <laughs> in, like action movies. Yep, yeah. Um, so, yeah, he, he uses liquid nitrogen to freeze Ron Silver to get the tape back and then cuts his hand off to get it and uh, eventually like and then they destroy the whole satellite because of the ball that was in ron silver's hand the ball the Uh day what do they call that day ss machina or whatever day sex machina yeah pretty much (laughs) like it's just so all that happens everybody's destroyed and then they like they barely get off of like the satellite that's out there and we see kiki standing nearby who managed to avoid all the destruction and this is where I got even, I'm already confused, right? Uh, like, because Kiki, we find out, is a bad guy. Kiki could have stopped Charlie Sheen multiple times at the beginning of the movie. Oh, but yeah. instead is actively helping him. It's so weird. all But yes. So then he's helping Ron Silver. And then Charlie Sheen's yelling at him. He's like, this is what you wanted? Like, if you guys wanted help, you could have, like, asked. Why did it have to be like this? Why couldn't you just come and ask for our help? Then you tell them. You go back and tell them that I know. That she knows. That others will know. It's not going to be easy. Not anymore. And then I'm like, so wait, was Kiki trying to take down Ron Silver? That's what I thought too. Not... Like he's like the uh, the reluctant stormtrooper who realizes the error right. of his ways and right. joins the rebellion. But no, no, he he's just a uh, he's just an alien in disguise and uh, went about it a really ass backwards way of um, yeah, you know, man, monitoring Charlie Sheen when he could have stopped him from the beginning, dude. He could have. He could have thrown him out the window. He could have, um, right? At any point, he could have stopped from putting any, all of this into motion. This entire he movie. straight up tells him he's like, "Oh, we looking for a big signal or a small signal? Because this is a big one." It's just yeah. like he could have just not told him that there was a signal and yeah. not sent him to Mexico, where he effectively learned everything that was happening. He <laughs> also there's that weird look between him and Phil's two goons when they show up. And he's watching them, and I'm like, I guess you could say, like, oh, he let them do it because he, they're all aliens. But then I'm just like, what? But what? We like, don't what, get what that. Is he gonna... Yeah. Yeah. We don't it's get just... that. It looks like he's super suspicious of what's going on. Yeah. Yeah, again. And then it also raises yeah. the question of just, like, are they replacing humans? Are they able to just, like, was Ron Silver's character, like, he's just been an alien for so long? And I don't get me wrong. I know this is, like, really split in hairs. But I'm just like, he's able to get to the top level of this facility um, as an alien? Or did he replace the guy who was already at the top level of this facility? Did this kid really live with his grandmother next door? Or did he replace the kid? Like, or is he like sweeping 
just because he's just like, I'm just an alien, so I'm going to sleep and help clean up things because I got yeah. nothing else to do. Like, it was just this, so many, I was left with so many more questions than answers at the end of this movie in a way that felt lazy. It was lazy. Well, welcome to Aliens 101. It's just... Yeah, <laughs> always, more, always more questions than answers. But yeah, so basically, Kiki's knees go backwards. He runs off into the distance, and we don't know what happens after no. that. But um, let's see. We just uh, cut to the next thing that happens is like oh, a yes. radio breath. Yep. We're seeing that like global, like whatever the aliens are doing is working because everything's like it's like 120 degrees in California and like. You know, it's like still 90 degrees in New York, but it's like September or October or whatever. (laughs) And uh, so all this is happening. And then uh, it's interrupted with footage of Ron, of the footage, like at some point they got the signal out, that footage is out there of Ron Silver saying what their plan is. Entirely without context, entirely without like any idea of what these people are seeing. It just plays it and that's supposed to be the big like, oh, like, Everybody knows now. And right. I'm like, no, what? What? No, because again, what? we have a million questions. You showed us a video of a dude saying, yeah, you're kind of right. Oh, yeah. Don't say any, don't dig any deeper. Like, what What context are we supposed to put this in as the right. uh, innocent viewer whose broadcast is interrupted? It's just like how, right. I, it, I understand what the writer was going for. This, you know, boom. Sure. Everything's about to change. The plan has been unveiled. Uh, Zane wins. But again, I would just be like, huh, that was a weird prank that someone put on the TV. You know, that this is happening. Yeah, right. Before. You know, the Max Headroom right. prank back in like the 90s, you know, that yeah. went, got broadcast <laughs> across England and whatnot. Um, like this mm. should happen. So I don't know what they were really trying to do. But, but the overall message is global warming's real. NRA is bad, apparently, to Charlie Sheen because he got a gun really easily. And like you mentioned, that was one of the many comments in this movie that I'm like, right, oh, right. Uh, you have a clear stance on the NRA, NRA, good sir. <laughs> but um, yep, that's it. That's the movie. We uh, we can only hope that Zane convinced the world of this alien invasion and they stop it. But Andrew, they didn't stop it because I don't know if you knew, but there was a sequel, The Arrival Two. I saw mm. that, yep. Came out in 1998, starring Patrick Muldoon from Starship Troopers fame. Love it. Love me oh my God, Muldoon. Man. That I was watched... a big year for him. It was. I watched the trailer. Holy shit. Yeah. Next level sci-fi original right there. Um, hey, a, a fun little connector here, too, because you've been on my podcast plenty of times. Um mm-hmm predominantly for um like we've done some regular episodes but also you've come on to do some shocktober episodes yep right and one time we watched a little movie called night of the demon (laughs) right so um the director of arrival 2 is a man named kevin s tenney who also directed night of the demons you're welcome I, it means nothing in the grand scheme of the universe, but I just thought that was a fun little connection there. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, so I can only assume that Arrival 2 is some Oscar-worthy stuff going on. Oh, big time. Um, he I... also directed movies like Pinocchio's Revenge, <laughs> Demolition University. Um, like he, yeah. Oh, dude, if, you, dude. if you were going to say Demolition Man, that's a different story, but come on. It, it is. No, Demolition University and then Witchboard and Witchboard to the Devil's Doorway. Um, there's just a lot of and people. I think I've even said that he directed a movie called Bigfoot at one point. We don't have to get into it. That was one of the last <laughs> movies he directed. Um, but y'all, if you haven't seen Night of the Demon, Demons, do yourself a favor, question mark and watch that movie um, it's real bad i can uh, uh, oh, yeah right. Oof. all right oh, we made it through oh Whoa. jesus christ our poor listeners um i know God. final thoughts on the arrival Lady. um i really i just it was a real bummer to watch okay. i'm not okay. gonna lie and again because of people like Almost active, like immediately, the response when you put this out on Twitter was people saying, Arrival sucks, The Arrival is much better. That's such a fun movie. And maybe it's like nostalgia for people. Maybe it's just like, I don't know. Like at, at this point 
in my life and where we're at in the world, I'm like, yo, if you can get enjoyment out of something, fuck everybody else. Yep. Enjoy that thing that you enjoy and stay and don't listen to a word I just said. That's awesome. Enjoy it. Have fun. There's probably people that watch this movie like once or twice a year. And yep. that's great. If you're enjoying yourselves, awesome. I did not. <laughs> <laughs> I totally understand it. Well, hey, this is going to be my new tradition. I'm going to watch this every year. Um, there you go. But <laughs> I, thought it was, I thought it was fun, goofy, unhinged. Uh, mm-hmm. and what else did I write here? Good commentary on global warming and that we don't yeah. preserve our planet. And I agree yeah. with that wholeheartedly um so i'm giving uh i'm giving it two out of five smashed assholes there (laughs) i will say like you know what i've watched plenty of bad movies that have nothing to say so at the very least this was talking about global warming at a time when that was like just becoming like you know something to that we should have really been talking about yeah so good on them for that you know like that and again got some heavy hitters in that cast it's it's a cast full of workhorses like people that they are not coming to fuck around so but uh, what i they even they make a note of this that this movie came out and are right around when they started marketing independence day so i mean talk about stealing your thunder you've got this kind of you know not you know huge budget movie although it was pretty big like you said for for what it turned out 25 million dollars is that's a lot to, uh, in 1996 like that's, yeah. you know yeah not at all i can't imagine that's how a much big budget independence day's budget was but look i mean those i remember when the independence day marketing came out and i was just yeah, like astounded dude. so mm-hmm. again that might have had something to do with this movie uh performing poorly but there are many variables to why this movie did not do as well yeah as we had hoped let's move on to brighter pastures andrew and talk about 2016's arrival this is the day they arrived the object touched down 40 minutes ago mama what's going to happen i don't know dr banks you're at the top of everyone's list when it comes to translations you hear any words is that yes am i the only one having trouble saying aliens what do they look like? You'll see soon enough. They need to see me. Dr. Bank? Now that's a proper introduction. More objects have landed around the world. It's their language. We got 21 hours before they start global war. They're not our enemy. We need to talk to them. It's more complicated than How is it more complicated? Are you dreaming in their language? What does it say? Weapon. So how do we clarify their intentions? I go back in. What is she doing? You are committing an act of treason. Do you trust me? May I read the synopsis? Please. A linguist works with the military to communicate with alien life forms after 12 mysterious spacecraft appear around the world. Very straightforward. Denny Villanueva, Villanueva, I'm sure I'm pronouncing his last name incorrectly, but this is like... Yeah, I'm not sure. Dude dude has just got like hit after hit for the last like three, four movies he's made. Um, depending yeah, what do we on have? who you ask. But we've got Sicario, I believe, okay. um, was him. Um, we've got this. We've got Blade Runner 2049. And oh, now wow. we've got yeah, yeah, yeah. I and love we, that movie. Love, love, loved it. Oh man, Ryan, I'm gonna I'm gonna out myself right now and I intend to change this soon. I haven't seen it yet because I haven't seen the original. Blade that's fair I, I dude i'd never seen blade runner until about a month ago when uh my girlfriend introduced it to me and uh nice oh yeah go watch it go watch it nice. and then watch 2049 2049 dude i was bawling my eyes out i'll leave it at oh that. nice i'm a sensitive awesome. guy to begin with as my listeners very well know but uh <laughs> the fact that this director made that does not surprise me in the least he just has a complete grasp on emotion and like yeah man profound profoundity is that a word i don't know sure sure yeah we'll say yeah oh he Um, did uh he did the he's doing the new dune movie i see right yes cool cool okay yeah man which looks pretty neat i gotta say and i'm never that's another one i like i'll out myself again i think last year i tried to watch the 80s dune and i was 
I was, I got stoned. I was like, it was like a day off. I was like, I'm just going to have a good time. Watch this movie that everybody always says is crazy. I made it like 35 minutes in and didn't. I think I fell asleep or I might have just like turned it off and it was like, I'm going to do something <laughs> else. And I've never been able to get into those books because I've heard they're like, uh, like they're pretty dense. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but I just, yeah, like, so the, the new one and, you know, it looks like it might be have some more like action elements to it. Maybe I'll, I'll like, you know, people will get rightfully mad that like, it's just like, well, that's not what, like, I don't know. I, I yeah. don't know enough. It looked good, man. And hey, Aquaman's in it. That's all I really care Boom. about. Boom. Yeah. <laughs> Yo, speaking of stacked casts, that thing is insane. Oof, I know. I know. Yeah. Ugh, I'm so happy the, all these movies got made before the pandemic because now we have so much For to real, look forward to, man. Yeah. But, Even though, I mean, productions, there's plenty of things getting made right now. I will yeah. say, like, they, they are really putting uh, <laughs> money over health right now, which, like, that's I a guess scary. do what you're gonna do yeah like cool. but the anyway we're not here to do for art that. yeah yeah array yeah. now based off a book have you read the book it's a short story by uh ted oh, Chang, okay. and i actually read it for the first time last night um oh was, nice yeah I, i'd been hounded to read it for um ever since the movie came out and i just uh -huh. never did but um i read it last night after watching the movie maybe i should have done the opposite beautiful it's like 40 pages maybe um okay but and i was you know the i this is what i hate when you see a movie and then read the book you've just got the actors in your mind you've got sure like what the director's vision was in your mind when you should be separating it completely so um is, but, is it different is it like a different kind of a take or is it relatively the same it's relatively the same uh there is okay yeah, yeah, there, there. I would definitely suggest reading it. It's you know nice. same premise and everything, obviously, um, and out. Right. But yeah, there's some cool stuff in between that the movie doesn't touch on, and vice versa. Okay. But um, yeah. So based on the short story, and uh, oh, let's talk about the cast. We've got Amy Adams. Oh yeah. Forrest we got Whitaker. Amy Adams, Forrest Whitaker, Jeremy Renner, Hawkeye. Michael Stuhlbarg, baby. Woo! Who's that? Which one's that? Michael Stuhlbarg. He's the CIA agent. Poor yeah, man's dude, Joaquin Phoenix. <laughs> I think he looks like Joaquin <laughs> Phoenix. Am I wrong? Yo, no, I no, you're not. Because I actually, back in 2008 or 2009, I saw a production of Hamlet in Central Park. It was uh, the public theater thing. I was able to, it was like one of those lucky times where I was able to get to, like those free tickets for that. Um, and I, he was the lead. He played Hamlet. Um, and he was much, he was much thinner then, not that it matters. But I remember thinking at the time, like, man, this guy looks like Joaquin Phoenix and not putting that together until later. Like, I eventually saw him on, a, he was on Boardwalk Empire. He was a big part of that show. And he kind of like blew up more significantly after that. Okay. Um, but he, yeah, I, I would agree. He looks, he looks very much like Joaquin Phoenix and he is a, a beast like <laughs> i love michael stuhlbarg he's somebody who if you get a chance like i guarantee you, you've probably already seen a movie that he's been in where he shows up just kind of like owns and then leaves um but he's <laughs> yeah Jack i Dunn. was i was super i i kind of forgot that he was in that movie and then um when i saw it, when i was watching it last night i was like oh so i literally yelled stuhlbarg <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's good to know. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. I, I saw he's, that he's production great. of uh, Hamlet as well, dude. That thing blew me. Oh, out. really? Yeah. Yeah. Talk oh, about, cool. Talk about changing the ending to something. Uh, we won't get into yes. it. But, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, let's get to the plot. So we've got Amy Adams, Luis. She is a linguistics extraordinaire, I guess. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, teacher, expert, whatever, whatever you want to say. Yep, yep. And uh, we start with what we perceive as flashbacks of her and her daughter, and she's giving her daughter messages of you know, memory is a strange thing. You know, we're all bound by time and and the order of time and and uh, and whatnot and. Yeah, we see that right in the beginning here, as we get these flashbacks, that uh, her daughter is unfortunately diagnosed with a very rare disease and, right. and presumably passes away at some point. And then, boom, we're put into the present time of when this movie starts. So, yeah, this is 
this is interesting. She goes into class at her college to teach her class. And right away, something's up. You know, everyone's phones start dinging all at the same time. So that's never a good thing. Clearly, right. something's going on. There's either an active shooter on campus or a, a uh, natural disaster is about to happen. Something. Something's going on. And um, we learn that something or some things have landed on the planet. So, yeah. Boom. We, yeah, we don't waste much time getting into what's no, going to happen. No, you movie. really don't. I mean, the movie itself, I mean, it's so wonderfully constructed. First of all, it, it's a little less than two hours, and it makes such good use of that time. Um, there's very little fat. Everything is leading us towards the end game. And it's something where I almost wish, because there's a big twist in this movie. Um, mm -hmm. We'll get to it. Yeah, um, and I can only kind of remember what it was like watching it the first time without knowing the twist. Um, but watching it the second time, it's almost like experiencing a, dear, a completely different film. And this is probably like maybe the third or fourth, maybe even fifth time I've seen it because I saw it twice in theaters. I saw it originally, and then a friend of mine was going to like a SAG screening where I actually got to... Um, uh, uh, there was a talk back with Amy Adams afterwards, and I got oh, to ask cool. her a question. Um, like it was so. It's I I I I, lo I absolutely love this movie, and there's little things that you pick up on each time that you don't necessarily pick on up up, up on before. And because right. of course it's like Sixth Sense or or anything, you're now looking for because it's a good movie. There are clues to the ending. If anything, they're telling you the ending throughout the movie. Um, absolutely oh it's just so yeah. well <laughs> structured it's, it's I can't wonderful believe. man yeah yeah it's well structured it's incredibly shot it's when they're doing the first like so she gets picked up by the government to go because they're contacting these aliens and they don't know how to talk to them and she helped them translate some farsi a couple years before mm -hmm. and she still has classified uh, um, cl or high classified clearance or whatever so they ask her to and at first they don't like she tells them that she needs to go there and they're like, no, we're going to use somebody else. And when she finds out who it is, she asks them like this interpretation question. I, I wish I could remember specifically what it was right now. Um, yeah, it was like a certain word. And what does something mean, mean in Sanskrit? Um, yeah. And uh, it was basically the guy, like the guy who answered it for them had a more violent answer, if I right. remember correctly. Like, right. um, so she's brought in and the first time that they're flown over in the helicopter and they're looking at the ship and the first time we see it up close is uh, one of the most beautiful shots. I have that ring right here, movie. man. Yeah, it's just, uh, you get this wide landscape. It's in Montana, I believe, is where they are. I think so, I um, think so. So you see the first craft in, like, in the shot and it's, this mist is rolling over and it's just uh, so... It, that's gorgeous. when I first saw this in theaters. That was the moment where I was like, "This is unlike any alien movie I have ever seen." Yeah, this is yeah. this is art. This is high art at its best. Yes, and yep. um, well, let's uh, so Forrest Whitaker plays the colonel who hires her. Um, yes, one one question I do have, and this okay. is neither a criticism nor a concern. It was just something. What's going on with his accent? I don't know. That's one of the yeah, yeah, things people have. Yeah. I, I was just like, is he from Boston? Is he from, like, it's I couldn't so tell. weird. And I, yeah, and I'm just like, maybe it's a Montana accent that I just have never, like, you know, I don't think I've ever been to Montana, so maybe I just didn't recognize <laughs> it, but I thought it was so strange. Oh, um, it was weird. But, um, but oh, that's, like, a minor gripe. A minor. In this movie, in my opinion, has minor, 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 if any. Minor, but uh, very we'll minor, get to that. For real. But, uh, well, okay, so we have the craft in Montana, but we should mention we learned that there's 12 of these craft. Yes, uh, yes. Placed throughout the world. We don't know why, why they are, where they are, what's in them, what purpose they're there for. So that's what we're trying to figure out. And that's why they hire mm -hmm. this linguistics communication person is let's right. not immediately assume they are going to destroy us, but that is the military's job to protect us. So yeah, yep. let's let's figure this shit out. And um, well, and I will say I was happy that like, listen, we don't have to get into current events too much. But one of the things that is like uh, one of the things that's wonderful about this movie is it's very hopeful. And one of the things that's terrible about these, this movie is that now we are we live in such a world where we 
have now been proven. It's been shown how we as a country would react in a situation like this, in yeah. a situation where there is a possible world-ending scenario or a, like whatever. Um, obviously, what's going on right now is not as serious as if 12 giant spacecraft landed and started hovering over certain areas. <laughs> but it's not hard to think that based on how we are reacting to things currently, that there are people that would just um, assume um, that these things don't aren't real. Mm -hmm. uh, there are people that would try to like fly planes in them. There are people, there would be way more, like we would have to stop attacks on these way more regularly, like just from like Joe Schmo in the middle of nowhere who doesn't want to believe, like it's just, there's so much of a more hostile reaction. And it's not like we don't get elements of that in this movie, but the actual, I unfortunately, how we are in real life would have been much more like things would have gone much more poorly than right. they do in this movie that's a good point bottom yeah. line yeah yeah the movie is very timely which is interesting too because mm -hmm. the short story was written long before the movie came out and also the oh, movie, really the movie came out i want to say within weeks maybe a month or so of um the most you know contentious election in like american history right. yeah a very interesting time for this movie to come out okay so 12 of these objects are all, all over the world people start panicking like you mentioned um a little bit and this is interesting they get the press secretary um on the news say regardless we have protocol for situations like this and i'm like wait hold on what what so i go and i'm like is this just in the fictitious world that this writer created and no and I should have known this as a UFO wow. guy. And there have been rumblings of it. But yeah, supposedly there is uh, military briefings from the 1950s outlining potential military responses to alien contact. It's called the, the seven phases to contact. You know, it's rumor, it's speculation. But yeah, it's interesting to think, yes, our governments do have somewhat protocol for things like this but we know the minute it actually happens that that's going to be thrown out the window as we right. see in a pandemic we were told we had protocol for the pandemic and clearly we did not so yeah yeah very interesting uh dichotomy there but um yeah, yeah. I, I and and to see how things are reacting like it's it starts what I love is like you know we see it's a very like clean operation and we see that they are like following protocol and things like that and communicating with other countries where this is happening. And I love that it like kind of starts that way and then things start to dovetail out of control once we're actually getting information from these people. Like she starts doing her job and ironically enough, that's when things start to go wrong in their eyes. Yeah, that's a good point. Well, okay, so let's get to into what she's doing and with who. So we have uh, a astrophysicist who's played by Jeremy Renner his character name is mm -hmm. Ian, and he's being brought on because, yeah, we need someone there who can theoretically tell us how, possibly how they got here and um, what we might be dealing with in terms of the physical craft they're in or uh, and stuff like that. So I thought it was really interesting. I think the military did a good job of bringing in someone who needs to decipher how to communicate and someone who might decide how these things uh, got here and stuff like that. So, um, right. Yeah. What did you think of Jeremy Renner's character when you first, when he first came out? I, I liked him and I liked that. Like, I mean, he's, he's instantly trying. It was honestly one of those things where I was like, you know what, Jeremy Renner's a good actor. He's not bad. <laughs> like, yeah. No. Yeah. Like he's, he is somebody who I think does what needs to be done for this role. Is it a little bit more of a straightforward role? Absolutely. But what I like is he's got like this kind of heart and humanity to him that it make him like appealing as a character. Like, you know what I mean? Like he is somebody who you understand why they would get together, why he's like a good choice for this. And you understand why um, I, I mean, I love the idea that they're bringing in like uh, a, a scientist as well. But yeah, no, I really enjoyed him. And I enjoyed that character, especially because it's like, it's second fiddle. And that's like, that's something for somebody who's an established actor to take a role like that. Like, you know, men aren't always like, that is not to, not all men or whatever bullshit, but it's uh, like, obviously I don't mean that, but it's just like, he was an established star and he took on this role, even though it's like, it's a support system. It's a yeah. support role. Um, yeah, I like, think that's and, a testament and, to uh, he probably was like, this is a good script. 
Yeah, man. And in, it's something where, like, you know, we're never really hearing his side of it, especially when things get in more into detail about their life together or their life after this. Mm-hmm. We don't ever really get his side of things. It's all about her, but he took it on anyway. So it's just night, like, yeah, I really, I thought, like, I just thought it really worked. And he's got some of the last lines in the movie. And it's something, it's this speech that you could almost in the hands of a lesser actor would have come across as very hokey and cheesy, yeah. and it wasn't. So, I, so yeah, I really enjoyed Jeremy Renner in this movie, and I liked, um, I liked the role that he played, um, not just like in a literal sense, but like the role that his character played in that movie and how it, it, it um, laid out. And he's much more important than we think, uh, but we'll, yes. we'll get to that as it unravels. But um, mm-hmm. let's see. Oh, this was another interesting thing. So, okay, so now we need these two to go to the craft and try to communicate with whatever's in the craft. But what I thought was interesting is they show, like, someone in, like, either a containment thing or a body bag. I can't tell which. But they ask, like, right. what happened to this guy? And the, the army doctor says, look, this is some people just cannot process this. And that hit me so hard, man. Cause I'm like, yeah, what if you were hired to be the first to ever make contact with aliens, like face to face, not through radio waves as Zane would do, but like literally go up into a craft and talk to these things. And the human mind, I could imagine with a lot of people just simply could not do that. Right. Yeah, yeah, so that no, really and, puts and, and, it into like you know perspective of how weighty this actually is. Yeah, and it's something too where you you st- it's a bit of foreshadowing as well to see some of the problems that they're going to face with other people. So it's I I was I was I I liked that like that nice little tease, and we see elements of her like you know things don't go great the first time they go up there. They right. see these things, these, when we see these aliens for the first time and you only kind of get a glimpse of them at first. And I love their design too. Like I love, like, I, I, I hate giving credit to HP Lovecraft. I know he did great work, but he also called his cat the N word. Like, Super oh, racist. Like, I know, I know. Horrible <laughs> racist, like a horrible racist. And it's always funny when I see people try to, ex- I read an article the other day that was trying to excuse his racism. Like he was nice to some people. And it's like, uh, no, like I'm sorry. So is Hitler. Like, yeah, exactly. Like he, he, like he, uh, did he cause physical harm to other people? Not that we know of. Did he, make his racism part of his identity and are most uh brown people in his books described as swarthy and gross yes so it's i i I, whatever however (laughs) uh his big thing was that in his opinion aliens aren't it weren't alien enough even in the early 1900s and the stories that were told they're always like bipedal and they look like they're humanoid um so i loved to see the aliens in this movie be like, I, I don't like yeah. it's something that we wouldn't be able to wrap our heads around. I don't right. know what I would do if I saw something like that in real life. Dude, I, I don't mean, even understand how, how does it breathe? How does it move? How do they communicate? I... Like, it's just, it's, it's something where it's not an easy, it's not an easy answer. Whereas like in the arrival, you know, it's like, Ooh, their knees bent back. Mm-hmm. Um, like that. Even that's, <laughs> even, even that's uh, imaginative. Usually we get just, yeah. These- humanoid figures or these little gray aliens with big heads and black eyes so i mean yeah. you know, the arrival at least they tried a little something different but then sure. arrival like boom you're right this is like yeah. this is the epitome of the word alien it's so foreign to us and so not mm-hmm. human uh that wow it was and i'm sure i think i read somewhere they went through so many art concepts to create these aliens and what they would look mm-hmm. like because the the short story doesn't describe them that well so it really oh, was put into a i mean they were definitely heptapod in the way that like they sure. have seven, seven feet or legs or whatever however you want to define that but um other than that man I, I would love to see all the different concepts they came up with but uh i think they're yeah. like something truly unique in this one for sure uh, yeah, but that's man. the other thing dude like first seeing these things it probably was not what they expected at all or if they expected anything what would you expect when you're first they didn't brief them which i think is weird they didn't like psychologically prepare these two for what they were about to see and maybe that's good maybe that's bad i don't know 
I think it is like it's something where they it's almost like time is of the essence kind of a situation because there's a competition aspect to this as well where the countries you're trying to figure out and it, yeah, it, yeah. it, it ex exposes like something that's like a very real problem I would think um, where it's just like ooh, some people like are trying to figure out things before other people um, right and trying to be the ones to get these answers so I I, I I understand, like, it's almost like they ease them in. It's like, all right, every time that thing opens, you're going to go up there and talk to them and, like, try to communicate with them. The first time, we don't even see the full interaction. Like, they see it, and then they're brought down to be, like, cleaned off or whatever. And she, like, and she's, like, kind of jittery, and Jeremy Renner just blows jokes. <laughs> like, I was like, that's pretty fantastic. That's what I would have done, yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, oh, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, okay, so now we've got, like, this, this kind of um, regiment set up where these two are going to try to find out how can we communicate with this and figure out why they're here. That's the big question. Why are they here? what do they want and that remains the way it is in the real world here you know we had a secret pentagon mm -hmm. ufo program and their sole purpose was to figure out if these ufos that our navy are witnessing and our military are they a threat and of course to the right. military, they will always remain a potential threat because we don't know what they are right who's in right. control of them so i understand every side of this movie I understand Forrest Whitaker as a military person. I understand her as a linguist. I under it makes perfect sense, and I think this movie just uh, does it so so brilliantly. Um, oh, okay. So now she's trying to teach these aliens words, like hu the human interactions, like how we do things. Right. So, what did you think of this whole concept of like how I she liked did this? I liked that, like, it brought us into that world a little bit. Something that I like, and you don't always have to do this, because it's not an easy thing to do without boring your audience, but they were they had simple enough explanations as to why she was doing the things that she done it, did. And, like, like, funny enough, we are kind of Forrest Whitaker in that situation, where he she has to explain to him why she's doing needs to do things the way that she's doing, and through that, she's explaining it to us as well and we find out like oh like you know we find out about like what a linguist would be doing like what she would be doing in this situation to try to communicate with these things how you have to break down like okay i can't even like ask them a question unless i they know i know they what know a question what a question is. is oh my yes. god yeah like something i would You're never like, think about yeah like when she breaks down that one sentence the what is your purpose here or whatever um, it, like the, the ways that she breaks it down, I was like, it's smart, it's interesting, it's well explained. Like, there's so much of it where I was like, yeah, this is like, you know, this is what it's about. And this, it made the movie more interesting and it right. helped it rest on something that felt tangible. And yeah, I, I, lo I loved all of that stuff. Like, wow. I, I thought it was so well done. And again, I mean, like, the difference between an Amy Adams and a Charlie Sheen. And, you know, maybe Charlie Sheen, and I've actually never seen Platoon, so maybe in Platoon he makes a very believable soldier or something. Like, a, you know, what? like the guy was famous for a reason. You don't yeah. have to get into that. But it, his character in The Arrival does not know, like, does not seem like he really knows what he's talking about when he talks about astronomy. Amy Adams in this movie, I believe every fucking word that she says. Oh, <laughs> like, absolutely. Like, like, she really, I, like, it felt like she studied this stuff. Like, it just feels natural to her and how she's explaining it. Right. Um, and I, I remember reading they had, like, several world-renowned linguists come in to, uh, see, to that's contribute. Awesome. Yeah, so that, that right there. Um, yeah, and, like, this other idea, too. Like, you mentioned this one sentence she breaks down. Like, mm -hmm. what is your intentions here? Like, and she she what? focuses on the word your. Like, we don't know, we don't want to know the individual alien why you're here. We want right. to know as a race why are you here. So that, right. again, it's just so brilliantly done. Everything you're doing there, I have to explain to a room full of men whose first and last question is how can this be used against us? So you're going to have to give me more than that. Kangaroo. What is that? In 1770, Captain James Cook's ship ran aground off the coast of Australia, and he led a party into the country, and they met the Aboriginal people. One of the sailors pointed at the animals that hop around and put their babies in their pouch, and he asked what they were, and the Aborigines said, kangaroo. And the point is? 
It wasn't until later that they learned that kangaroo means I don't understand. So I need this so that we don't misinterpret things in there. Otherwise, this is going to take 10 times as long. I can show that for now. But I need you to submit your vocabulary words before the next session. And remember what happened to the Aborigines. A more advanced race nearly wiped them out. It's a good story. Thanks. It's not true. But it proves my point. So mm -hmm. we get these montages of like, they're slowly learning how to communicate with these aliens who use mm -hmm. a really interesting way of communicating. And that's this like, almost like squid ink, because they have these yes. tentacle like things that produces this ink that turns into a mist and makes these circles with all different splatters. So it's like, whoa, like, this is interesting, not how we would ever imagine communicating. But um, wow, we get the concept of the, um, the Zepper Wharf hypothesis, which is uh, mm -hmm. the language you speak determines how you think. And we don't think about that. We always think the words come first when in reality, like how we describe something or whatnot determines our way of thinking of it, like a color. You know, there's a right. billion different versions of yellow, but then when you say the word, then it then it produces the image in your head. Oh God, I yeah. just this stuff goes so deep. It really does. Yeah. And 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 what I love too is like our first breaking moment is you start to see like I love when they take off their suits for the first time because she's like, they have to see me. And she walks up to them and like she does it and they're like, should we abort? And they're like, no, keep going. And then Jeremy Redner does it, and the guys are like, permission to abort? Like, can we leave, please? <laughs> like, and they're just like, no, stay. Um, but to see that guy, like the guy who gives them their, like, badges and who introduces, introduces them first, we start to see his slow mental break with what's going on and how he feels scared. And then, like, we have our first bit of um, action, quote, unquote. And this yeah. is not an action movie by any stretch of the imagination. Oh, no, this is God. a slow it's burn. just not. Yeah. Yep. Um, but he, like, he does this. Um, uh, he takes it upon himself after talking to his wife. Like, you see, or not himself, there's several of them, these soldiers that are just like, we're going to blow this thing up because it's not good. Like, they, they're scared of it because they yeah. don't understand it. And it's because there's also, they, like, she interprets the word weapon at first because, yes. like, language yeah, yeah, yeah. is tricky. Um, through these things. Um, so he, like, to see that happen and to see the aftermath of that, it's something, and then you start to see all the country, like, uh, the weapon thing gets out and other countries start shutting down and, like, not talking to each other just on this one word that they're one not word. even 100% sure of yet. Right. It's just, I thought, I thought, like, again, that stuff is just so grounded and feels so real in this unrealistic situation. Exactly. Um, I yeah. just love it and and we also get to like not to go over too much but the um i we when she first analyzes the way they're communicating with her these circular squid ink things she starts to have flashes of her daughter yes yes please yeah touch on that yeah and it's what's so wonderful about it is if you're watching it and this is the way the movie plays out when you're watching it initially um just to kind of get into the big twist here is when you're watching it initially, you're thinking like, oh, she's having flashbacks of this daughter of hers that died of this awful disease. But that's not the case. Yeah. She's seeing, because when she learns this language, she gains the ability to see the future. So oh, the first God. time she's really, and not even as, like they say see the future, but I feel like it's so much deeper than that. She's experiencing time all at once, essentially. Yeah. And that's the way their language plays out. So when she sees this, the first time she's experiencing this language and really digging into it, we see those powers and those gifts start to manifest. Mm -hmm. But when you first watch the movie, you think that she's just having visions of her daughter who already passed. Memories. But yeah. in actuality, yeah, when you're rewatching it, you're like, holy shit, she, the first time she looks at that language, the powers start to, like, she starts to see into the future. Um, and I just think it's so, it's so well made. It's so subtly done. Um, in that aspect, like the way they handle that twist and the way that it plays out, like it's they they leave just enough breadcrumbs for you to where you don't like. I like I when the little when the daughter they have a flash or a a, a flash forward 
of the daughter asking the question about the zero sum game. Mm-hmm. And she's and she's like, ask your father, he's a scientist. I can't remember um, if that was, I'm having a hard, because Joy was telling me that that wasn't the time when I first realized it, because I talked, like we had talked about it before. But I I don't know. Yeah, I just, I love the way that that plays out. And there's some, there's certain times where I think at a certain point, you're like, oh, duh, this is it. Mm-hmm. But now, like, yeah, I just, I thought it's a, it's just a beautifully done twist. And it's incredibly impactful to the story as a whole. Which but then it opens up some crazy questions in my mind. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. That then we, we start were having dealing with, about um, last night. You end up where we all do when time plays a big part in a movie. Right. Is you're going to have endless debate on it. And that's completely understandable. Um. Well, yeah, you know, bringing it back to the the sort of circular nature of their language it it is mm-hmm. it's like it's just a concept that we create here on earth which yeah. is time and that it is malleable and you know there's yep. she even brings up as a linguistics person you know nonlinear orthography which is language has no forwards or backwards that's why she right. named her daughter eventually as a palindrome hannah mm-hmm. you know, same backwards and forwards and it's just the way they deal with all these things it really is it let's, really uh, is, man. Let's rein it in a little in terms of, I guess, how the plot is playing sure. out. So they, like you said, we get the word weapon from them and other countries start freaking out and everyone's like, oh God, like, what does this mean? And this is when, you know, these rogue military guys decide we're going to blow up the ship here in Montana. And uh, we get uh, Ian and Luis go into the craft not when they're supposed to, to talk to the, the aliens. Right. And the bomb has been set in the craft by these rogue military guys. And what happens, the aliens literally forcefully get Luis and Ian out of the direction of the explosion and mm-hmm. presumably save their lives. But boom, now we have a whole nother level to this. We have now provoked an act of war on these aliens that we still don't know why they're here. And uh, yeah. And, and what I love too is they don't leave; no. they just raise like a mile higher. In oh the sky. my! Talk about a flex, and, and, dude. <laughs> yes, yeah. And Forrest Whitaker's got that great line of he's just like, "Why does this feel worse?" Like right. this, it, like it's 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 such a like, and it's true. It's and it's also almost a way of them going like, "Bro, we're not trying to hurt you guys." Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're trying um, to communicate. Uh, we're trying. Yep. And you're right. It like it was maybe I don't know, maybe hundred feet off the ground originally, and now it's right. like a mile and a half up. So yep. it is. It's like the most uh, mentally psychological warfare at its finest. Like, well, nice try, but we're not done yet. We still have more to communicate to you. In which they do. So I just I um, oh here's another moment I really liked. I love when. Luis has this really intimate conversation with Ian while the craft is just floating in the background. And it's just like, it's the dichotomy of humans interacting while an alien craft is present, attempting communication. And then we have these two humans communicating about like, oh, I, I'm not so good with women, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and it's just, I love this moment. You've just got a UFO yeah. floating in the background and these two are having the most like human conversation that turns out to be something much more powerful than just like a yeah, movie, dude. like flirtation or whatnot but um i loved that but uh this is when we get um all the countries who have been in really good communication and trying to decipher each craft in each region and what it's doing what they've discovered uh everyone starts to disconnect and go offline and stop talking to right yeah and it's because china and russia do it first i guess yeah. and the u.s is just like well we gotta we gotta do it now like it's 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 it becomes this like pissing contest in this very serious situation yeah um and it's uh it, yeah it just bums me out like <laughs> that was the moment in the film where i'm like this is how this would play out in real life and it fucking yeah. depresses the hell out of me yeah, I literally, I turned to Joy. I was just like, and this is fictional. Like, this is not a real thing. And I was just like, this fucking sucks. Like, yeah. I just, like, I was, so, I get so enthralled when I watch this movie that it feels like that stuff is just happening. God. Okay, so 
all the countries stop communicating when with one another clearly china is taking a very aggressive stance and if they do not figure out why these things are here they're going to assume it's not good and they're going to attack so this is scary man now we have might have a a war on our hands and uh Mm -hmm. America and more specifically this location in Montana, they want to evacuate the entire operation. And right. uh, Luis is like, no, we have to go back and deal with this. Like we have to continue the work we've done so much on um, with these right. things before that happens. So she kind of goes rogue herself. She goes out to the craft and the craft sends down a pod to get her. Cause it's like a mile up now. And right. Uh, Oh, well, man. And what do you think of this? Of yeah. the, well, and this is the moment where I first really thought about this is I and this is always the tough. There's no right answer to this. Let me say that right away. Um, but this is like a Dr. Manhattan kind of question, like a predetermination type thing is she has a vision of herself going out and a pod coming down and picking up and then herself in the ship. So she envisions those things happening. So because she has those visions she goes out so that pod can pick her up so the question is like did she have a choice did she she does this because she did it already like and that starts to get into that that plays a little bit with the end game too which we'll get into a little bit later like in a minute but i yeah like that was the first moment where i was like huh like she must have already done it or else she wouldn't be having those visions or so did she? Does she have a choice? Because she's having visions of the future right. already. So it's like, ah, that's again, this is where it's like there's so much left yep. to interpretation, which is yeah, what man. language is all about. Um, mm-hmm. So presumably, let's say she did get up there. She's actually beyond the glass or beyond the separation that has been there this yes. time. And she is in there with uh, who we've deemed Abbott and Costello, according to uh, Jeremy's right. character, which I love. Um, except just uh, just Abbott it's just Abbott because right? Costello was killed in the in the explosion right Costello is in death process is what the yeah um, says yep. um, mm-hmm. so now man we're getting subtitles from our heptapods so we're at yeah, we're dude. at next level communication now she is yep. directly talking to them without you know converting anything or the symbols like ah oh, it's gorgeous like she's having a full-on conversation with with mm-hmm. the heptapod and um let, let's get let's just let's dive in because this is the moment where we start to get some big reveals what is yeah. the they communicate to her um that she has so they communicate that we're here to help they were there to help the humans because in three thousand years humans are going to help them mm-hmm. um and they say to her that they they're like she has this gift to see the future because of her ability to read the language it's like once you're able to read and i think it's implied this way anyway is that once you're able to read the language you basically start seeing time differently so um once she realizes that and she has these flashes of this daughter she's like who is this girl like who is this daughter that i keep having flashes of and that's when they tell her she can see the future so it's the daughter she hasn't had yet and uh, it's uh. just it's just heartbreaking and especially re-watching those scenes too like i said because there's some moments where you're like any time when you're re-watching the movie and you see one of these flash forwards happen you realize like she knows yeah she yeah. knows the entire time she has this daughter that this girl is not going to live past like 14 15 years old right and it's and to make that like to still go through with it and that's where i start to get so uh, it was, so anyway so she says that she can see the future uh, they tell her she can see the future and she's sent back down and she tries to communicate with china she takes the cia guy's special oh. cell phone that he's had i uh, wish i want one of those things man that's <laughs> right. um uh, general she, the general of china's army yeah. and speed dial yeah yeah well it's not even just speed dial either it's that she has a vision of the future and again we get into the predetermination things where she's at this party when everything has worked out right and when she's at this party the general the general from china approaches her and says like it's 18 months later and that he knew that he needed to the only reason he came there was to see her and she's he gives her his cell phone number his phone number to his private phone 
right because he tells her you called my phone he's she's like i don't have your number and he shows it to her he's like now you do and he's like you also told me my wife's dying words Mm -hmm. and he tells her the words 18 months in the future and because of that she's able to tell him that over the phone when this happens even though they're like under threat of death and treason and all this stuff from the military and then so she calls china and then she she says this dude's words to him and then the next thing you know it cuts to a moment and at this moment like i'm even getting choked up thinking about it right now um, <laughs> uh, you start to see these tv screens pop up and you find out that every like things have worked like everybody's decided to work together now yeah like they're going to start sharing information they're going to start communicating and because of that the aliens leave like and what's beautiful about that is it's not even like the aliens were like there is a pressing issue right now it's like no it's almost like a a a more advanced bill and ted it's just like listen (laughs) if you guys start if you guys start working together now the future will be a better place and it's like it's so simple but it's so effective yeah. Um, and you find out that Jeremy Renner was her daughter, is her daughter's father, like father in the future, mm-hmm. um, and that he left because he finds out from her that he like that she, she knew this was going to happen. Yeah, would die. Yeah, yeah. and mm-hmm. decided to have the daughter anyway. And I will say, like, like I said, you have these great moments where Jeremy Renner says, like, you know what? I thought the most surprising thing about being here would be the aliens, but it was meeting you. <laughs> and, like, you, I know, dude. And that's just, like, fucking, again, in, a, in the hands of a lesser actor, that would have sounded real corny. But it exactly. just, he does it real well. And then you have this moment where you find out, like, you see to the moment, like, he asks her, do you want to make the baby? And she says, yes. And I love that moment, and I think it's beautiful, and that's, like, where the movie ends, kind of, like, where it begins, because we see that house in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And I will say, now, this is, like, where we'll get a little heavy predetermination-wise, is did she have a choice in that moment? Yeah, that's the question. That's, I think that's what really, that's one of the biggest questions with all these time sort of ideas of time and concepts of time is, like, what is determined, what is not, um, you know, if the the general of the Chinese army, uh, General Shang, if he gave her his phone number in the future and then we go back and she remembers the number and calls and blah, blah, blah. Like, again, it's so non-linear and circular right. like their language that it's like, mm-hmm. what is choice? What is free will? What is predestined? Right. But does it even matter? You know, right. I, I like we could spend our entire lives questioning if destiny exists or not or fate. Uh, yeah. When in and reality in one, we're I just mean, living it. Right. And I mean, in this one though, she's seeing visions of a, of the future where she had that daughter, and it and it's it's almost like she has the daughter because like it's just again like we could go on and on, but it was the first time that it really hit that really hit me last night. Yeah. Um. But yeah, and I just love it's just got this very simple ending where she's just like. She says yes, and and it's that's like that's kind of where it ends, where she chooses to live this life anyway. Yeah, um, and it's, it's just beautiful. It's just a, and the 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 soundtrack. Like Joy brought up a wonderful point. Like the soundtrack, like it's so minimalist leading up, and then it's just got these big swells of music towards mm-hmm. the end. Um, that just really paint this full. It's this full picture of just a core, like just a gorgeous movie. It is. It is. I just the score it. was I absolutely love it. The score was beautiful, like you said. Um, I, I don't know who the composer is, but um, just everything. You're right. The cinematography, beautiful. The acting, spot on. The, mm-hmm. the concepts, the questions, the... Um, oh, God. I, um, I, I cry every time I watch this because, like you Same. said, it, it will mean something different to everyone. And I remember mm-hmm. seeing this in theaters and... Uh, I was with my girlfriend and she was just bawling her eyes out. And yeah, when we left, I said, well, oh my God, well, that was so emotional and powerful. And she, she, I was like, is that what made you cry? And she was like, no, it just made me so sad. And I sure. was like, I left the theater being like, but I feel so happy and hopeful. I think it was beautiful. But again, I think that's what's awesome is everyone finds small moments in this movie that is going to mean something special to them right if you knew your child was going to die uh would you still have the child and that's right look 
many parents have struggled with that choice, I'm sure, in their lives. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is a big question, you know? Like, if you knew what was going to happen tomorrow, how does it affect you today and how you live your life? And, um, oh, God. And I I, I would argue, I think it's the movie is sad because it's so hopeful. You know what I mean? Like, we we just, we don't live in that kind of world, unfortunately. And at the time, like, I would even argue that when the movie came out, it felt more within grasp. Um, yeah. But I, I like uh, since then, it's just gone further away from from that kind of hopefulness of what humanity is capable of. Um, and like, don't get me wrong, it was humanity under extreme circumstances. But you know, we're in pretty fucking extreme circumstances right now, and we're not doing great. I, so <laughs> I'd have to agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's it's <sighs> something where like you watch it and you're just like, well, shit. I want like you know. It's a movie, so of course things work out a little bit easier. But like, it's just like a nice resolution like that would be wonderful. <laughs> be nice, yeah. But as we yeah. learn, the older we get, life doesn't seem to wrap up that way. But um, no. I don't know. What do you think, man? I'm giving this seven out of seven heptapods. I think this is a perfect. I movie. think that's. I think that's an accurate rating. I would I, agree. I would yeah. agree. I really like. You know, there's, there's. An, I, I every time, every time I watch it, I have fewer complaints. Yeah. Like, and, and not that I had complaints really to begin with. Like this time, the most I had was I was like, yeah, Forrest Whitaker's accent's kind of funny. That's it. <laughs> and that is, that is small potatoes because I just think everything else about it, it I, I agree, adds up to a, a, like pretty much a perfect movie. Like, yeah. I just love it. Well, I can only watch this like once every two years now because it's that powerful. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You got to let it lay, lay for a while. You really do. Unlike The Arrival. <laughs> which we're ooh, two times a year baby from here on out Easy. every six months <laughs> i need more kiki. i need more kiki in my life <laughs> oh man this was a marathon but hey it brother, was i uh i appreciate you taking the time not just to do this today but to watch these two movies and well, to, I mean, it was uh, my pleasure all of it led me to it's it, it's i was amy adams in the sense that i was like i know if i watch these movies i get to talk to ryan about them so i'm gonna watch them <laughs> this was all meant to happen see exactly see yeah yeah um well andrew before we go before we leave today mm. i have to ask what are you up to where can we find everything you're doing tell us all sure. about what's coming up for andrew sanford Let's see, if you are, um, uh, again, I've been writing for uh, Pajiva.com, which is a wonderful website. There's stuff on there that's much better than what I'm doing for them. Um, but just check that out, P-A-J-I-B-A. Um, I love that website. Um, uh, so it's a pleasure to be amongst a lot of really talented writers. Um, I, uh, if you're like anybody, I think it has to have like a certain kind of coverage, but a lot of my screenplay stuff is on coverfly.com. So if there's some industry professionals that just happen to be listening right now, <laughs> um, go ahead, check that out. Um, of course, I have the backlog of Half White Son of Black Man. We haven't been back yet, but the old episodes are there. You can still listen to them, including plenty with you, some Shocktober ones. And um, we're not going to do Shocktober as per usual this year, which is when I usually just throw out the purpose of my podcast and talk about horror movies uh because we're not doing the podcast proper what i'm going to do instead and ryan i'll just like officially invite you to do this now uh, with me is i'm going to uh one movie one guest and we're going to talk about it on instagram live pretty much like oh, nice cool. little like 45 minute to 55 minute segments talk to somebody about a movie that we just watched um I'm, I, so i'll be hitting you up about that soon but if you want to follow along with that um, my name is, it's because I didn't understand at the time how Instagram worked when I first started it. It's half white under, it's half white son of a black man, but there's underscores in between each word. Um, but it's pretty, it's pretty easy to find me out there. Um, and yeah, so stay tuned for that. I love, I was just like, man, I love me some horror movies. I'm not going to let this pandemic stop me from like, I might not be able to do the podcast right now, but I'm still going to like talk to some friends and people I respect about horror movies. So be on the lookout. For that awesome man yeah hey we need communication now more than ever if arrival mm-hmm. has taught us anything um, <laughs> <laughs> we we all i i know people out there probably people listening myself included like it's so easy to feel very alone and trapped right now yeah. and out of control of 
of your life and what's going on, but just know that there's always someone out there to listen, uh, as all of you have done with us today. God bless everyone listening to this. Yeah, for this real. Thing. Yo, if you made it all the way to end the end to the end of this, like you yeah. like both of these movies, or you like hearing us talk, or you're fi- you're trying to make sure you have all your ducks in a row before you give a shit on Twitter later. So <laughs> exactly. either way, either way, props to you. But um, <laughs> this has been an epic arrival showdown. I hope everyone enjoyed. Andrew, stay safe, brother. I will talk to you soon. And My thank pleasure, you buddy. once again for coming on Somewhere in the Skies. Uh, thank you. My pleasure. Somewhere in the Skies is produced by Third Kind Productions in association with the Entertainment One Podcast Network. Actually, I look like a can of smashed assholes. <laughs> <laughs>